Similarly, hello everyone. I'm uh, Samuel Bessier, co-director of the Culture, Mind and Brain program. It uh, gives me great, great pleasure to welcome so many of you, so many invisible you, uh, for what, what we intend to be the first of a series of events dedicated to critical perspectives on the new normal. Uh, we're realizing that uh, in trying to make sense of this crisis, many, many voices are needed, and particularly voices from those communities that are most impacted by the rising inequalities uh, and health and economic disparities exacerbated by the pandemic. So our next event will be dedicated to giving voice to these perspectives. Please stay tuned uh, for an announcement. In the interest of uh, time, allow me to jump right into introducing the themes we hope to explore in this conversation on social science perspectives. And forgive me for relying on my notes a bit, given the abstract nature of this uh, interaction, I cannot improvise as well. So the question was, what do anthropologists uh, like myself or psychiatrists or a combination of the two, like many of my fellow panelists today, can contribute to this conversation? Uh, we're not virologists, we're not infectious disease specialists in the strict sense of the term, but if we are to take only one of the many, many lingering questions to make sense of this crisis, for example, the puzzle of why some countries and some communities appear to have been much more impacted by the disease itself and by the measures against it, it seems evident that um, a very, very broad array of expertise is required to disentangle all the very complex set of ecological, economic, social, cultural, psychological, uh, but also informational, technological, and even existential variables that are at play in this crisis. So the aim today is certainly not to present one view or model, uh, absolutely not to present or argue for one ideological position, but rather to ask difficult questions. So the panelists will each share uh, perspectives and burning questions and concerns from the perspective of their own disciplines and their own personal reflections as scholars of the human sciences. In terms of my own growing laundry list of concerns and questions, um, speaking from the perspective of a cognitive and cultural anthropologist who studies the evolution of human sociality, but also, and this is pertinent to today's questions, the impact of the internet on mental health, uh, cognition, and society, um, well, I can only mention a few of my questions, uh, but my, my first concern, first and foremost, is uh, that the toll of the disease and of the measures against it, if you will, can be argued to have accentuated a number of pre-existing social, economic, psychological, and technological pathologies. We could call those pre-existing ecological comorbidities. So COVID, in this sense, might be argued to have laid bare a lot of the ways in which the old normal was already kind of pathological. Take, for example, the unspeakable tragedy that happened in old people's uh, nursing homes in, in many high income countries. Epidemiologists are fond of saying that uh, countries with a higher number of older people are the hardest hit. But take Japan, for example, which has the world's oldest population, but was comparatively spared by the disease compared to, say, Italy or New York City. So one way to make sense of this from a social science perspective, well, in many Western countries, the problem was already there in the form of rampant individualism, the demise of extended uh, family support structures, disregard for elders, and also the rather strange and sad cultural practice of sending old people to die alone in sort of decrepit, understaffed, underfunded long care uh, facilities, long-term care facilities or take the many, many, many pre-existing social and economic problems that are projected to worsen considerably in already marginalized communities that are, and I insist, triply impacted by the disease, by the toll of the lockdown, and by the toll of not having the luxury to obey social distancing measures. So we can mention a few of those, uh, loss of job purpose and meaning, uh, rising death of this peaks in suicide, substance use, domestic and gendered violence, minority stress, xenophobia, stigma, uh, but also rising case severity and excess death toll from mistreatment for all non-COVID related illnesses. So in a sense, those who are already suffering will suffer more again. Many of our panelists who are here today will address uh, these issues with more authorities than I can. Uh, what concerns me most today and what I feel most competent talking about is another silent pre-existing ecological pathology, if you will. And I'd like to invite critical questioning uh, without downplaying the risk of the, the actual terrible risk of the disease 
on the dangers of technologically enforced uh, big business enriching social distancing and also on the dangerous ways in which the configuration of our current digital and cognitive niche was already making us sick, fearful, and angry. So we could mention the toll of moving most of professional, social, and education uh, life online, and that's easy to describe. There is, of course, a wealth of research on the impact of screen time uh, and a, a loneliness on cognition, attention, retention, mood, uh, impaired social and problem solving skills and developmental delays in kids, to mention but a few problems. But as so social scientists, perhaps we ought to have a few critical things to say about uh, the risk of increased surveillance and oversight from tech giants, uh, who are of course more than happy to keep us glued to our screens as they embrace the new virtues of distancing. Um, but also the increasing bureaucratic oversight in universities, the push to cut costs, rationalize, overplan, micromanage, undermine flexible pedagogy and move online. Those moves were already in place in many ways, but it gets worse. And I'd like to talk a little bit more uh, about what I've called the digital cognitive niche. In recent, in recent years, and I'm mentioning my own work here also, the internet had already taught us a lot about some constraints on human psychology and what I'm tempted to call invariant regimes of attention. The long story short is that human minds uh, tend to crave negative and social information above anything else. So humans like to judge the reliability of information based on its social source rather than its content. And human minds and my psychoanalyst colleagues can talk more competently about that, tend to also like information that confirms our innermost fears. And it's a little odd because recall how the internet also gives us access to basically almost the whole of human cultural memory, right? Uh, so this could have yielded a beautiful epidemic of beautiful minds that look like a, a Borges library from a Borges short story. But in fact, we know uh, from clicking data that the internet had monopolized our attention about around four or five themes. So those are fear, pornography, shopping, so that's flexing and social signaling, moral outrage, and anxious social comparison. There was also the old romantic promise that the internet would bring about this connection of uh, you know, universalist democracy and would connect all of humanity. But of course, especially since the tragic year of 2016, uh, we have also learned that the internet has really yielded more of a manic pinball game of angry political tribes, desperate to find clues confirming the stupidity of the other tribe and the righteousness of their own worldview. So we know that when the human mind is faced with an abundance of information, uh, it tends to be a little uh, allergic to, to nuance. It tends to ju jump to cues like fat and sugar in another domain that confer a really strong survival advantage. So of course, our hunter-gatherer brains did not do well with fast food and they're not doing well with fast information. So we need, we need to talk about that. For example, the naive information consumers demand uh, for bad news. If it bleeds, it feeds. Well, this is a well-studied phenomenon in, in cognitive science, a phenomenon that has now exploded with an absolutely psychotic 24-hour news and social media cycle. So recall, in, 20, in 2009, H1N1 killed an estimated five to 600,000 people worldwide and infected over a billion. Now, why didn't H1N1 become a cognitive media, political, legal, and technological event? Well, I'm going to suggest because most of us didn't start using smartphones until uh, 2010. Now, would we have been better off then had H1N1 become such an event? I don't know. I think we need to dare asking that question. Let's talk a little more again about how the human mind loves uh, monocausal explanatory models and is allergic to nuance. And my fear is that online, we all tend to down gear to a below average human mind. Take the problem of how really difficult it is to identify reliable, but also nuanced information on how to just make sense of this crisis, where it comes from and what to do with it. Take what in my view is the most tragic uh, information event to have happened in recent months, the politicization of the lockdown versus no lockdown debate. The adoption of anti-lockdown perspectives by the Trumpian right that have made things exponentially worse because again, recall uh, pre-COVID, folk epistemology was already hystericized and Trumpified online. Now, in asking questions about the impact of lockdowns and when and how they're 
uh, necessary, there's an immense set of ethical, epidemiological, political, economic, and social trade-offs that you know, we need to ask. But my fear is that for the average human mind, including that of top scientists, the question has become an either or good, bad, safe, unsafe, uh, binary, uh, simple question. With Because of the Trumpification, we see the liberal media doubling down on hypothetical doomsday scenarios that increasingly read like tabloids, and the extreme right doubling down on antisocial, uh, gun-obsessed, xenophobic discourse and action. One final example, Dr. John Ioannidis, he's a world-renowned epidemiologist at Stanford, one of the most cited epidemiologists, and from the beginning, uh, he has been uh, producing studies showing or claiming to show or lower infection fatality rates than the init initial WHO models. Dr. Ioannidis has repeatedly disavowed any political partisan agenda and, and, and he's absolutely disavowed any association with the Trumpian right, but he's been demonized by many on the left and by the media. Uh, of late, for example, uh, two of his long YouTube uh, interviews were taken down by YouTube as, as of this morning for violating content. So I'm going to suggest that as social scientists, we need to resist this kind of hysteria and we need to dare uh, ask difficult questions. Uh, one final uh, detour through social and behavioral science, if I may. History, as we all know, has shown that in time of pandemics, disasters and increased uncertainty, xenophobia, conspiracy theories, and violence towards marginalized groups uh, has been on the rise as people try to find a culprit. Um, now, the primitive psychological mechanisms that underpin these processes are important to consider because fear of witchcraft, uh, superstition, moral outrage, and fear of infection by invisible agents, they recruit the similar kinds of apotropaic, meaning uh, looking for the prevention of danger, cognitive templates. We know that racism and xenophobia recruit pathogen detection brain mechanisms. We know that the language and metaphors that people use to justify moral outrage and xenophobia employs pathogen metaphors like vermin, grossed out, uh, sick people, et cetera, et cetera. So my worry here is that it's again too easy, it's too intuitive to just point the fingers at others and feel that we're on the right side of history in considering this debate too, uh, with too much simplicity. For example, when I see uh, Canadian Twitter and the righteousness with which people express their desire to keep the US border closed and to keep the zombie apocalypse on the other side. When our po politicians in Canada say that they're trying to find ways to make the public feel safe and comfortable as they fear the influx of Americans. Now, if one were to substitute the word American with Mexicans, the aberration would be readily apparent. Uh, so similarly, when neighbors denounce each other for holding illegal kids' birthday parties, or when everyone is assumed to be a source of infection or recipient of blame, there's, there's a lot of complicated questions that social scientists, I think, must ask. So I'll, I'll just conclude by saying that, you know, most of history's hard-fought civil rights battles began in universities through productive dissent and really counterintuitive insights generated in difficult conversations. Why counterintuitive? Because it has often been, the reason why civil rights battles were difficult to fight uh, was that as far as the public and most people were concerned, there were no civil rights violations. And, you know, the pathology lay hidden in the normal. So I would like to invite you all to resist the convenience of our fears and our political alliances and to instead dare to ask difficult, nuanced, counterintuitive questions together. That's it. That's it for my little introduction. I am now very pleased to introduce uh, our next speaker, uh, Professor Cecile Rousseau. Thank you, Samuel. I'm, I'm very tempted to go on with your arguments because this is a field that I like, but I won't. And I'll stick with what I had thought of sharing with you today, which is quite clinical. So let me jump back in the past. 40 years ago, I was referred a young Salvadorian man for psychosis. Uh, he was afraid in Montreal. He was afraid of Toyota Jeeps and very afraid of being spied in on the buses. He was convinced that that was happening and concluded that these were normal survival strategy of the war in El Salvador that he has been suffering for the last few years. And he was not psychotic but it looks foolish at the time in Montreal. Now, just think with me, six months ago, 
if you had seen a person walking down the street, making a big detour to avoid you, not looking at you in the eyes, maybe you would have thought, uh, there's something wrong with me. You know, <laughs> uh, do I look foolish? And looking at that person, you would have seen that that person would take risk and go in the street to avoid other people, all other people repeatedly averting their gaze. Maybe you would have thought there is something really wrong with that person. She or he may be paranoid. So there is, we know there is a link between symptom and culture, but there is also a very strong link between symptom and context. What I want to address briefly today is the normative nature of symptom and how the pandemic is prescribing some symptoms. Of course, I will not see, there's not a lot of normalization of symptoms in pandemics, uh, cyber dependence being just one of them, which of course is kind of normalized and, and valued. But I want to talk about uh, cyber dependence. What I want to center on is a, a paradoxical injunction, which I think has deep effects on the social relation and the social fabric and our relation in health institutions and our relation in families. So the confinement, I would argue, is a mass prescription of avoidance. We prescribe uh, very powerfully make, making people afraid enough so that they would comply. Agoraphobia, you know, people, you have to stay housebound, well, which is a qualification for agoraphobia. Uh, we prescribe a primitive fears of contact with others. Uh, others are considered as dangerous, as potential predators, to the point that, you know, we even sometimes at the beginning, I was fascinated in the street, I would look at people and they would avoid eye contact as if eye contact was contagious. So, so it's a very powerful prescription of avoidance and agoraphobia. On the other hand, and I think there is a paradox, there's a call for action for some people who are called essential workers. Okay, so what's essential? Essential, that's the whole semantic around what's essential or not. Uh, and these people are called to action, unprotected, and even if they know they're unprotected, so there's not enough mass, but still you have to go. And, and so it's a push toward risk taking, which would be considered acting out. You know, if, if you push somebody to cross the street when there's no light, and there is high traffic, you will say, well, this is risk taking. So and I think that that happened a lot and is happening still of course, in the nursing homes, in the CHSLD, but also in, the, in, in, in a number of other realms, including, of course, the, the healthcare. Uh, so the thing is, between these two, or on both sides of this paradoxical injunction, there is a layer of moral discourse around these two opposite stands, which evoke virtue. Uh, so on, on the side of confinement, uh, I could have a number of quotes for you, but there is a righteousness, righteousness of being perfectly confined. Uh, and people, people in family, argue and battle and fight. Who is more confined than other? Are you transgressing? I'm doing it right. So righteousness of being perfectly confined. And on the other hand, on the paradoxical side, the heroic position of being on the front. You know, the position or the term guardian angels. The guardian angels are moral figures. They're protectors, they're super protectors. Uh, and they're good, of course, good people. And I, I would think that there is a pendulum, both internal to all of us, and certainly to in me, between both position in the self, in families, in teams and in institutions. So in health teams, this is very evident. I can tell you endless stories about family being divided between the heroic versus the 
a righteous, perfectly confined position, uh, fight when you are a healthcare worker, you're putting us at risk, you're not taking any uh, enough risk in teams, you know, uh, what are you hiding off, uh, why are you not coming to work, uh, why are you taking so much risk, so endless conflicts and tensions, which create circles of blame, which, which is very similar to the purity discourse that you have in uh, classical anthropology. So purity and danger as, as, as motives organizer of the discourse, which are present also now on online things. And I think that the push toward delations uh, in the uh, social sphere, so reporting people who do not confine well enough, reporting staff who do not go to work well enough, uh, further rupture this social link. Uh, it, it's, it's very similar to a self-promotion of being a moral brigade like in Iran or in Soviet Union. Okay, so we, we uh, denounce and it legitimized aggression in the streets. So old people in Quebec have been pressed in the street because they were not supposed to be in the street. You know, so yes, I, I'll go rapidly. Uh, so all these blame for not being virtuous enough. Uh, in, we were just discussing it before the, the talk. In the US, it's played in the street, uh, Rochelle was talking about that, between the people who have masks and the people who do not wear masks. Okay, so these are markers of different position. And each position is a moral position. If you don't wear a mask, it's because you push for the liberty and the right to, for individual rights beyond the collective. If you wear a mask, you push for another discourse. But the moralization of this position, I think, is, is important. Now, how do we work with this conflict? Because our team have been doing a lot of mediation work, because as you were saying, Samuel, the fight is also in between communities. So in Quebec, it has been between the Orthodox Jewish community and the majority, between the Chinese Asian community and the majority. And now because of structural discrimination, and I will talk about that further in the seminars, between the Afro-Caribbean who are in the healthcare and the majority. So all these level of circles of blame and conflict call for something which is in terms of mental health, which is beyond anxiety. You know, people, when they speak about the pandemics and mental health, they speak about anxiety, because this is the okay symptom to have. They do not speak about these deep fights and conflicts which are not dividing our society. And I'll just finish with that saying that it calls for, there is a call to recognize the and validate this intense affect which are circulating presently uh, and are, are of course projected towards scapegoats with, within families, within teams, within institutions and within the society and, and to understand more and I think at the level of public health but also at the level of, of the politicians the uh, the collateral damage that these paradoxical injunctions are creating, and more than the paradoxical injunctions, they're moralizing side. So I'm calling for uh, indulgence. Thank you. Thank you very much, Cecile. I'm pleased to introduce our next speaker, uh, Professor Stefan X from the University of Edinburgh. Stefan, you have the floor. Thank you again. I think you have to unmute yourself, Stefan. I believe you have to unmute yourself, yes. Hello, can you hear me? Uh, can you see the slides? Okay, good. So hello, everybody. Um, I want to talk about social science in and into pandemic uh, epidemiology. Uh, and it's, I think, continuing quite nicely from what we've been discussing so far, uh, also from uh, you know, this idea of righteousness, because uh, one of my concerns is also very much on what went wrong and specifically what went wrong in the UK where I'm living. Uh, 
So the question is, first of all, you know, is the UK actually one of the hardest hit countries by this pandemic? Uh, when you look at the death rates uh, of this country, let me just get this picture off. Uh, so you have like an enormously high death rate here in the UK, both in absolute numbers, we're just behind uh, the US in that regard, and also extremely high in terms of uh, death per population. So I just checked again the number today is uh, 536 per million people. That's um, more than twice as much as the US even has. Uh, the case fatality rates are terribly high in the UK with 15% of those who are found to have the coronavirus uh, actually die. Uh, and it goes on and on. I mean, there's, uh, when you look at the testing rates, when you look at uh, doubling rates, almost in every regard, the UK has been terribly hit. And also there's been uh, research now on who are the people who are hardest hit uh, in the country. And turns out that people in deprived areas of the UK uh, are dying at twice the rate as people in average areas. So there's a huge, you know, this, this uh, goes with somewhere else uh, introductory point that it definitely seems in the UK that uh, the whole pandemic has brought out underlying pre-existing inequalities and problems in a really, really dramatic way. Much, much more dramatic actually than I ever thought possible. I still remember uh, I was doing research in Burma in January. And uh, so I have these pictures of me flying out of Burma with my face mask and then taking it off uh, when coming back to the UK, sort of thinking, oh, surely, you know, it's one of those Asian uh, pandemics uh, well done for reaching the safety of the UK. And I'm still in shock about myself, actually, just how incredibly wrong that perception was. Um, Further on, you know, with other data from the UK or when you then compare the rates uh, across Europe, these extremely high um, excess death rates that the country is still recording. So when you look at these uh, Euro Momo data uh, where you can compare excess death rates, which is arguably the best indicator of just how serious uh, the uh, pandemic actually is in different uh, countries in Europe and basically all other European countries return to normal rates after two or three weeks. Even Sweden re returned to uh, normal rates. They've just gone up a bit more. But the UK has been uh, recording consistently high excess death rates since week 13. And now we're in week 19 and the rates are slowly appearing to go down now, but uh, it's still, uh, you know, very bad, definitely very bad when you compare it to other countries. I want to bring in one point of that. Uh, there's a uh, uh, research that is ongoing that I'm doing, which is in a primary care center here uh, in the UK in one of the most deprived areas of the UK. Um, and I'm really, really interesting. What I've been working on basically prior to this blowing up is the question of multimorbidity. So this phenomenon of people having two or three or five or more uh, mental and physical problems at the same time. Um, and so I'm, I'm working in this clinic. It, this is in a deprived area pretty much the majority of the patients who come there uh, are multimorbid. Uh, it also, and this is this chart on the uh, right-hand side, there's this research that's been carried out uh, a few years ago by Barnett, which basically shows that socioeconomic status and multimorbidity are deeply interlinked to the effect that um, uh, when you live in a deprived area, basically, your chances of suffering from multi-morbid problems are much higher at 15 years earlier than the rest of the population, right? So we're all familiar with this fact that uh, an older generation, uh, you know, from 70 years onwards, it's quite normal almost. It's probably the majority of people who have several uh, health problems at the same time. But in this area, 
um, the patients basically they are in their 30s and early 40s and they are having five or more chronic um, problems and as you know I'm also working mostly on mental health and uh, pretty much everyone there has mental health problems but they are indistinguishable almost from all those physical problems that they're having with diabetes and with high blood pressure and on and on and on so when I also saw the, uh, you know, what are the main risk factors for actually dying of uh, this uh, virus uh, infection, it really turns out that multimorbidity is kind of the key predictor. And of course, then you add the fact that uh, multimorbidity strikes particularly hard in deprived areas, and you add that um, people are actually dying at more than twice the rate of uh, people uh, in richer areas and then you have already like I've not been able to go back yet obviously because of the lockdown to do this research but like th there's a real picture emerging of uh, a massive problem of uh, pre-existing multimorbidities together with uh, socioeconomic deprivation and one of the hypotheses that I have has to do also with the fact this is a major part of my research there is um, this phenomenon that all of them are not, they are not undertreated in any kind of way. They're actually, in my opinion, completely overtreated. You know, everyone is on five, six, sometimes 10 different medications at the same time. There's no coordination, no integration of, uh, you know, what are they doing with their diabetes at the same time with their other medications. So it, um, in my opinion, there's a, there's a massive problem there also and just people getting uh, way too little integrated care and, and uh, that there are probably a lot of harmful effects of the medications going on. And the second point uh, about the UK situation is, uh, you know, like looking at what was the uh, epistemic uh, preparedness in the country and then comparing that to the what went on in the rest of the world. And, uh, you know, there's definitely been a global pandemic of epistemic unpreparedness. Like when you look at WHO uh, ideas about, for example, when Wuhan went into lockdown and uh, the WHO representative in China said that the lockdown of 11 million people is unprecedented in public health history. So it is certainly not a recommendation the WHO has made. The WHO, it seems like, has never ever considered the possibility that you would put two thirds of the world's population into a lockdown scenario. And uh, I find that actually, you know, now looking back, it's almost unbelievable, like how this was never really modeled apparently. And then you look at other publications, uh, for example, the IMF has just published its World Economic Outlook and also starts with the admission that none of us had any meaningful sense of what this would look like and what it would mean for the economy. Again, you think, how is it possible that these major organizations would not have some sort of uh, pandemic model in their, uh, you know, in their drawers somewhere, thinking about what might happen if you would actually need to put uh, billions of people into a lockdown? Then um, there's this fantastic graphic, Global Health Security Index 2019, the countries that are best prepared to deal with the pandemic. And again, you look at this list and you just cannot believe what kind of expertise was that based on. You know, the United States, United Kingdom, best prepared countries in the world. What expertise was this based on? I have no idea. Um, but it is simply, you know, one of these absolutely shocking uh, revelations really of the past few weeks that um, the UK also thought that they would be perfectly prepared for this and then it turns out they weren't at all. Um, and it actually, you know, arguably it's almost like the UK was one of the world's least prepared countries in an ironic way. So you have, uh, I was just going through several of these uh, pandemic uh, preparation reports also that the government has been preparing. So what, the biggest one is the one from 2011 and then there was this um, sickness exercise of 2016 and um, you know you look at these preparedness plans and you read sort of what could happen they were modeling also uh, a viral epidemic of course they were focused on flu uh, and influenza so they were looking for something that looked like the Spanish flu 
but at the same time you could say well still you know what we're looking at now with the coronavirus is it's not that different right i mean the um, how infectious this virus is is not that different uh, how um, you know what what the mortality rates are is, is not that different so in many ways it's really striking that none of these models actually uh, even th that no one ever thought about what would actually happen and now that we're in the middle of this um, what has actually happened so for example in the 2011 plan uh, the only thing that remotely comes close to these lockdown measures that we're having is uh, the possibility of closing a few local schools is mentioned as an extreme, completely crazy outlying possibility. And then the report says that literally all sectors would have substantial and economic social consequences. And that's it, you know, you, I'm, I'm the anthropologist here, you know, I'm looking for those economists and the public health people uh, who I always think uh, would be modeling away with their uh, big data and crunching it uh, their away with their statistics. And that actually is the entirety of the preparedness plan of the United Kingdom, all sectors, probably have a substantial and economic and social consequences. That's it, nothing else. And the 2016 um, sickness exercise at least mentions care homes, which we all know also turned out to be an absolute hotspot of, uh, of uh, dying, uh, but nothing else, no details, no modeling, nothing in, in any particular way. And then you think, how is that possible? And yeah, it also turns out that when you look at the membership of these different kinds of expert group, there's not a single social scientist of any description on any of these experts panels uh, that are advising the government. I, I also find that simply, in retrospect, you know, simply shocking. How could that ever happen? You know, how it's important, of course, to have people who are uh, uh, doing, you know, how infectious are, is the virus and you need people who are doing the epidemiological uh, modeling, but also, you know, this turned into such an enormous, you know, the, the knock-on effects are just so enormous and all the measures that were actually taken were, were never modeled, never imagined, never anticipated. And there was this incredible unpreparedness really all around. So, and this kind of, just to, to wrap up, I mean, this comes also in the middle of me finishing a book uh, manuscript, which uh, is due in a week's time. And uh, so I've been working on this question also of value and values uh, specifically relating to uh, pharmaceutical markets in India, but globally also specifically with psychopharmaceuticals, but other pharmaceuticals as well. Um, and sort of I'm also trying to come up with a more general idea of what valuing actually means. And um, so the short version of it is that to value something means to make comparisons. So it's always some form of comparison that you're doing by relevant criteria. And these criteria, they're, they're infinite possibilities for comparing two things with each other, like because any two things actually have infinite uh, things in common, like uh, two things might both be uh, produced on a Tuesday or uh, two things are uh, within uh, 45 uh, minutes from the next airport or whatever, you know, there's actually a million possibilities of, um, uh, of finding relevant criteria for a value comparison. So the only way of paring down what these criteria should be is, is kind of a relevance. And the relevance is only established in a context of good practice, right? So the overall argument I'm making is really all about uh, of, uh, you know, very pragmatist uh, kind of argument also about how value should actually be looked at as a social process, as something that's uh, negotiated by people which works best when people uh, several different actors in 
a uh, value comparison, agree with each other. Uh, there's a consensus about what's happening. There's mutual recognition between the people who are participating in a value process. There's trust, transparency, routinization, institutionalization, expertise, and technological elaboration. Um, so, in, you know, then you would have all of these criteria also for when is valuing seen as successful? When does it proceed in a way that everyone sort of understands in a transparent way what this is about and they can agree on what this is about? And the scenario that we're having now is one of complete opaqueness of no transparency at all really because uh, again nothing was really modeled in any way nothing was anticipated in in what we're be particularly transparent about what the measures that were taken uh, would be would actually mean and the knock-on effects in in the long run because uh, they wouldn't even know right and um, Turns out, you know, that the institutionalization wasn't there, the expertise wasn't there, the technological elaboration wasn't there. And the final point is really, uh, you know, that we really need, still need to establish the relevant criteria for what actually makes a good value comparison here in terms of is a lockdown good or is it bad? We don't even know the criteria for that yet. Um, and that still needs to be uh, fully developed. And of course, we still don't have the criteria for when there will be, uh, if there ever will be a vac vaccine or a medication or something like that, you know, how you would value that also in, in that regard. So basically, you know, uh, this whole rant is my great shock of, you know, there should absolutely be social science in all of this uh, epidemiology of this particular pandemic and uh, it's not been there at all. Uh, no one even seemed to mind that it wasn't there. It has, as if no one had even noticed that the social science perspective uh, was missing from all of this. And that is my big shock, but really also something that really is so critical for this time, for this moment, for the next weeks, uh, not even just month, for the next weeks even really. This is such a critical work where the social sciences have to come in and say, look, uh, you know, we actually, you need this kind of expertise to make those kind of value judgments that you're now foisting on us. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. X, for, for really brilliantly exposing the multifactorial complexity of this problem. Before I introduce our next speaker, uh, a friendly reminder to our audience members that, that they should feel free to post their questions um, as, as we go along. And the questions will later be uh, curated and DJed by our discussant, Dr. Salomonova. Um, so, so feel free to post questions as they pop uh, in your mind. Uh, we're on schedule. I'm very happy about that. And I'm very pleased to uh, introduce uh, Professor Ding Wall from Nottingham Trent University. Thank you so much for taking the time to connect from the UK today. I'm pleased to give you the floor. You will need to turn on your mic, I believe. I'm just getting the, uh, just getting my slides on screen. Uh, but I, I, I would like to begin by saying that I'm, I'm a little bit disturbed about the extent to which Dr. X is writing me out of history, since I've been involved in on the inside as a sociologist of UK pandemic planning since 2005. Um, and I, I really should correct a number of the statements that you've, you've just heard. Um, in particular, the, <clears throat> the lack of, uh, the alleged lack of social science input when one of the critical subcommittees of, the, of SAGE, the main scientific advisory group to the UK government, known as SPY-B, is, is a committee of uh, psychologists and anthropologists um, uh, advising on, uh, on the, the social and uh, population aspects. Um, and Dr. X is also claiming that there was no modeling done. And the modeling simply doesn't appear in the plans. Uh, but for example, the, uh, the limited reference to school closures reflects modeling that was done, uh, which demonstrated the limited impact of school closure 
uh, on uh, infectious disease transmission. Uh, similarly, uh, there's been much criticism of the UK's decision not to introduce border controls. Again, that was based on modelling exercises that demonstrated that border controls were actually pretty useless in terms of interrupting transmission and interrupting the import of, uh, of an infectious disease into, into a country, uh, as I think has been uh, well established by the speed of, with which this pandemic has uh, moved around the globe. Um, I could make other points, but I do, I do think that quite a, th th there are some significant inaccuracies in the account that we've been given. But I don't want to dwell on those this evening. Um, what I really want to talk about is uh, a, a contribution um, which is very heavily indebted um, to, uh, which draws on the initially the, the work of the, uh, the French anthropologist uh, Edgar Morin, um, who talks about the, uh, the value of conducting a, a sociology of the present, the, the way in which crises reveals realities about uh, systems and processes that are normally hidden, uh, and the way in which the crisis reveals conflicts that are, are normally treated as settled. And in doing this, I want particularly to draw on some work that my uh, PhD advisor, Phil Strong, uh, was doing uh, on the uh, preparing a book essentially setting the AIDS pandemic of the 1980s in the context of the history of the threats of, uh, of pandemic disease. Um, Phil sadly died uh, relatively young uh, before he could complete that project, but he left this seminal paper uh, on uh, which was with the title Epidemic Psychology, or, although he subsequently thought he should have called it Epidemic Psychology, uh, Epidemic Sociology, because it turned up in lots of psychology databases and nobody knew what to do with it. Um, but the way in which, again, pandemics disrupt our everyday assumptions, uh, illustrate the fragility of human social order, um, and provoke uh, a great outpouring uh, and elaboration of human thought, morality, and, and technology, and that they can only be managed uh, when uh, new routines are in place through collective and individual action, which deal with the, uh, the, the, the social epidemics that accompany any pandemic. And Phil, looking back to the Black Death in 14th century Europe and uh, subsequent pandemics, argued that uh, all viral or bacterial pandemics were accompanied by three psychosocial pandemics. A, pand a pandemic of fear, suspicion and stigmatization, a pandemic of explanation and moralization, and a pandemic of action. And we can identify all of those in the, uh, the current episode. Um, the way in which um, <clears throat> distrust of human and environmental contact, as, as Cecile was, was saying, the, the way in which um, populations have been, um, been pressured by governments, the way in which I've used the phrase terrori terrorized by, by government in the literal sense of instilling a sense of terror about society, about anything outside the home, about any kind of social contact or social interaction, uh, which then becomes a, a major challenge to any attempt to uh, release people from the phenomenon of lockdown, something that the UK government is currently struggling with, uh, having done such an effective job of raising the anxiety of the population and the UK is the country that is evidencing the greatest level of, uh, I think the second greatest level of anxiety in any international survey. Um, now to persuade people to leave their homes, to venture out into the world, um, to, uh, to, to engage in any kind of everyday social activity. The issue around masks, for example, has been quite, again, been quite polarizing in the UK as, as I understand it has been with, uh, with colleagues in Canada. But where it's seen as a signifier, um, not necessarily of collective versus individual, but a signifier as of, of fear and, uh, and anxiety that 
putting on a mask is is something that says I am scared to go out. I am scared of other people. Um, I'm scared of society. I, I, I want to shut myself off behind this signifier. Um, and that becomes, then it, it reinforces the, uh, the, the issues of, 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 of the outdoors, of the unknown, of the interaction. Um, and, the, uh, and, and gives a, a kind of false sense of, um, in, in virological terms, certainly a, a false sense of, of actually interrupting transmission or resisting infection. And the, the sphere of suspicion, it overlies uh, pre-existing social conflicts. The, the cartoonist from the 2009 swine flu, um, uh, the, we see the tensions between uh, people in the countryside who, and their fear of urban dwellers who may come out and bring infection with them at the same time as they're demanding that the urban dweller subsidizes their way of life or, uh, or, or as it were, pays for the tourist facilities to remain closed. We've had a, an interesting weekend where urban dwellers are told they may go out and, and rural dwellers close the car parks at the beauty spots, close the toilets, uh, and, and then complain about the urban dwellers parking on all the highways and, and, and urinating in public places. Um, we see it in microaggressions, uh, the conflicts, historic conflicts between fishers, walkers, joggers and cyclists on canal towpaths and riverbanks. It, it becomes a new focus for uh, whipping up distrust, suspicion and conflict. We have the competing explanations for the disease. Um, it, it's not quite as marked as in the time of HIV AIDS, but we have the, uh, we have the obsession with this, you know, this is a plot from the Chinese Secret Service, something that's released from a, all the various conspiracy theories that are floating around. Um, the religious theories, in, interestingly, haven't been nearly as evident this time. I mean, you've had a few uh, American evangelists uh, who've declared that this is some kind of divine retribution, um, which is pretty much a feature of every pandemic since the 14th century. Um, but on a somewhat smaller scale, which may say something about the growing secularization of, of our society. Um, we have this vacancy for moralizing, as Cecile's already touched on, um, the opportunity for change and conversion. I've, I've been sitting on uh, some government advisory bodies looking at future scenarios. And one of the things that I'm interested in, particularly, particularly interesting, is the way in which kind of green evangelists have seized upon this as an opportunity for rewriting um, rewriting society not merely around a sustainable future but around a deep green future which looks very much less diverse very much less integrated uh, people living in much more kind of homogenous neighborhoods um, and losing many of the, the virtues that sociologists have historically seen in the, the life of cities. Um, if you, for those of you familiar with this literature, thinking back to, let's say, the work of Georg Simmel on the, the metropolis and mental life, the idea that cities are the source of the future, the source of dynamism, um, the source of, in, of human interchange. You know, they're, they're exciting places, they're innovative places. Um, and all of a sudden, there is an opportunity to change that direction um, into something which you know, to, to, uh, you know, may look very strange, a uh, society of stasis almost, um, where people never interact outside their own neighborhoods, uh, people never travel, uh, people are, 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 are rooted in some kind of nostalgic community. And we have the issues of action, um, the ways in which uh, limiting contagion may cut across um, and threaten conventional codes and practices. Um, I think that Phil was very prescient in seeing the way in which planning for public order could not rely on, on coercion. And as we've seen, we've had the, the threats, the, you know, the use of fear to generate uh, compliance. 
uh, rather than relying to any great extent on the forces of order. But I, I also think that <clears throat> there is something specific about the, this pandemic, um, which might we might have seen in 2009 if it, if it had taken off further. But comparing it with the pandemic, the influenza pandemics of the 20th century, 1918, 1957, 1968, where infectious disease was accepted as a fact of life, as something that we lived with, was not something that it was essential to fight against. I mean, in 1918, people did some great stuff, some heroic stuff. I mean, this is uh, 15 years before anybody knew what a virus was. And you have the cutting edge biomedical science of the day being, being brought to bear on the problems. Um, but the, for, for 57 and 68, we just see these as something that comes and goes. And yes, there is a strain. Um, you can see the photos of empty classrooms. You can see the photographs of overcrowded hospital facilities. But the unacceptance that uh, these things happen, people die, there is nothing that we can do to bring them under human control, uh, or very little that we can do to bring them under human control. And it, what we're seeing here in 2020 is a very strong expectation uh, that, you know, here is something that is disrupting our way of life and somebody damn well ought to do something about it. And if something can't be done about it, then, you know, heads must roll, people must be blamed. You know, it is a, it is a crisis. I think it's a crisis about the relationship with death. I think it's a, 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 a relationship. It's, it, it echoes, I think, many of the themes that I recall from the work of somebody like René Dubot um, about how we've forgotten how to live with, with nature, how we've forgotten how to live with the inevitability of death, and that what we discuss is not the notion that we could live forever, but that we can die well, and we can die in, in, in comfortable and appropriate circumstances. And I think that at least part of the challenge here is not necessarily about vaccination. It's not necessarily about uh, bringing this particular infection under control because there will be another one along. You know, human viruses have always trans translated from the, na the natural world to the human world. Um, as far as the virus is concerned, we're a single pool of potential hosts. Um, this is going to happen again and again and again. And we should not expect to sub sub subject the world of nature to our will in quite the way that we, seem to, we now seem to be doing, and which seems to be a peculiar phenomenon of our time, or if not a peculiar phenomenon, at least a novel phenomenon. And I offer that as a contribution to this evening's discussion. Wow, thank you, Dr. Dingwall, for these really humbling perspectives. I, I, I fear we, we, have to, um, we have to go on break now. I was particularly pleased to see some productive and respectful disagreement. I hope we can further hash these out in the discussion, uh, part of the seminar with the audience's participation. Um, but we, uh, I now propose that in the interest of keeping our blood flowing and for the health of our bodies, we take a 15 minute break and uh, reconvene as scheduled as uh, at 3.15. It's probably best if we all keep our, our, uh, our cameras, um, if, if we all stay connected. Thank you, everyone. See you soon. Welcome back, everyone. I'm really pleased, honored, and, and grateful for the dizzying array of historical, economic, and philosophical depth uh, that has been introduced by our panelists so far. Um, it is my hope for the second part of this event that before zooming back out into the grand, uh, big political and epistemological questions, we can also delve into finer grain questions of human affect and human attachment. Um, so in this spirit, I am very pleased to welcome our first speaker for the second half of today's event, uh, Professor Samuele Kolu, uh, an anthropologist here at McGill. Samuele, you have the floor. Thank you. Do you hear me? Yeah, okay. 
Uh, I'm not very, uh, I haven't learned yet to improvise on Zoom. So I've, uh, I've written uh, something, a little thing. <laughs> Just like a 10 minutes short delirious paper. Um, okay, so when asked uh, about uh, making this short and presentist uh, intervention about the present situation, I realized that I was falling in a Zoom trap. But because most of my neurons are also practicing social distancing, I didn't have the mental agility to refuse to make a fool of myself on Zoom by producing a form of instant thought about the new normal. And maybe this is a way to start framing one of the things that I want to share with you today. It seems to me that all sorts of intellectuals have been compelled to produce thinking through what I would call compulsive synchronicity a temporal genre that has its very condition of possibility in the ubiquitous presence of screens. Already caught by the temporality of digital forms of life, we're asked to produce an analytic about the present as if it was possible to think about the present in a synchronic way, live streaming our thoughts in real time while plugged into the machinic unfolding of the present. The ultimate dream of digital capitalism is to eliminate any lag between the medium, the message, and the response to that message. The attempted, imagined, and sometimes materialized erasure of temporal delays is the cybernetic rhythm of our psychic life. As we all probably know, thinking requires a specific type of temporality which is constituted by gaps, distortions, deviations, and more than anything else, lags and delays. Concepts need time to articulate themselves, to emerge and vanish, to be refined, to bump against walls. We need time to listen to our own idiocy and change our mind. We need time to keep coming back to our objects of inquiry. To produce synchronic tweet thinking cannot but force us to produce extremely thin, to say the least, forms of thinking. To be able to think, one needs to be non-synchronic with, with one, one's own present, to inhabit an untimely gap. Hashtag untimely, hashtag Nietzsche, hashtag Agamben. Now, I say this not only to protect myself from an internalized and anticipatory accusation of having produced an absolutely empty intervention on this Zoom table, but also to start formulating one of my uh, main concerns about the current consolidation and the current unfolding of this new normal, a term, of course, that would need time to be unpacked and criticized. My concern has to do with our relationship with time, and with the progressive erosion of spaces wherein we are not given the possibility to catch our temporal breath, as it were. Today, the erosion of thinking spaces comes along the erosion of affective spaces wherein bodies can bu cannot bump against each other anymore. Think about the erasure of pedagogical spaces in the context of, a digi of the digitalization of education. Today, we cannot catch our breath because most of us have been forced to move things, along, uh, move things along or keep things going while investing most of our time in front of the rectangular space of the screen. Zoom meetings, Zoom cocktail parties, Zoom yoga sessions to help, to, uh, to help you reach your Zoom enlightenment. Our everyday life has been Zoomified to such an extent that sometimes I just open the Zoom app start a meeting with no participants, and look at myself being seen by my own self. Only in that moment, I can experience an almost seamless absence of delay, a quasi-synchronicity, hashtag digital ecstasy. Compulsive synchronicity is pushing our whole bodies to look for closed cybernetic loops with no delays. And interestingly enough, we seek the absence of delays while lags actually happen all the time in our Zoomified existence. The most uh, hilarious delay I experienced recently was while trying to follow a Qigong class online with my frozen screened teacher who left me suspended between positions for half a minute. In that lag, I was completely lost. In that disorientation, I started thinking. Who knows if in this moment what I'm saying is being heard in real time, if words are getting lost through the media sphere, if my Italian accent is becoming thicker and thicker through the Zoom sphere. 
In any case, it doesn't really matter as probably half of you are right now checking their emails, reading the news, watching a TV show, WhatsApping my neighbor, or writing comments in the Zoom chat. Samuel, uh, who organized this round table, wrote something about the dopaminic slaps we get while constantly running after new information. How many notifications did I get? And what about now? How many people died today? 15, 20, 300, 30,000. Our compulsive synchronicity is accompanied by the sound of a compulsive clicking and a whole set of behavioral loops that should worry us, at least a little bit. Our dopaminic quest after the boosts of notification capitalism is the affective behavioral and psychic infrastructure of a fundamentally abusive relationship we have with digital media. Compulsive synchronicity and intermittent reward keeps us hooked to all sorts of digital abuse. Think about the romantic relationships and how people keep coming back to their abusive relationships in the name of a promise that will never be delivered. This time, this time it will be different. How different is your phone now from five seconds ago? How many people died? How many? And what about now? I will come back to this point, uh, reading bits and pieces of a text I've written with uh, Jean-Philippe Bombay, who was a graduate student here at McGill, but let me step back one second. The COVID-19 pandemic has produced some quite radical structural changes, while also bringing to the light a digital infrastructure that was already in place. So the new normal should be rather thought as an old normal that we seem to have already repressed. The new normal is the uncanny return of a pre-existent digitalization of our unconscious. This global pandemic cannot be understood if we don't explore how a digitalized collective unconscious mobilized a biopolitical docility to all sorts of restrictions and disciplinary injunctions. This crisis has magnified something that has been well underway in the past decade. I'm referring to what the philosopher Byung Chulan, among many others, understands as psychopolitical forms of power and control. To think about the present in psychopolitical terms is to consider how psychic life is today the privileged site of intervention of extractive processes that are capitalizing on our affects, our desires, our imagination, and our addictive attachments to synchronic loops of communication. The new normal is not about spending our day on Zoom because of a pandemic. The new normal is what has been, nor uh, what has been normalizing for the past decade. We're produced through and through by attachments to screens that we cannot let go. We cannot let go because our very sense of self is wired to the screen. We keep returning to screens that are draining us. I don't know if it happens to some of you, but after a few hours on Zoom, most of the times absolutely useless, after looking at other people that are looking at themselves being seen by someone who's also looking at himself being seen, I feel absolutely drained. Screens have this interesting capacity to suck out our vital force. Most of my Zoom friends and colleagues are in a constant state of exhaustion. We are depleted by cybernetic repetitions of embodied ticks. Click after click, we're always at work. Our digital unconscious is territorialized by a compulsive return to the same in the name of a new that is never really new. How many people died now? How different is your phone from five seconds ago? And what about now? The present pandemic is making so clear how entangled we are with ritualistic forms of embodied repetition that put us in an hypnotic state of depersonalization, a state of trance, if you will. Think about the hours we're spending now in front of the screen, reading newspapers, blog posts, interviews, medical reports, looking for a way to understand the present. We look for ways to think about the present while erasing the very temporality that we would need to think about it. We need less digital synchronicity. The new normal today shows us what has been the normal for the past decade. Our psychic life 
has been fashioned by digital assemblages, mostly engineered in the California and far west. The new normal is where we have already been for the past years, in and out of states of depressive consumption. Take the binge, which is now a normalized behavior. There is a Netflix uh, category now called binge-worthy TV shows. So we can loop within infinite loops of videos that play automatically one after the other. Psychopolitical rituals are in autoplay mode. There is no clear cut way out from this situation, and maybe this is not the point. I'm interested in calling for collective modes of inquiry that are both inside and outside our present. We need practices that can slow down, interrupt, and cut us adrift from, from what is grinding our psyche. We need to regain some breath, some space of maneuver, some imagination, something. To drift away from our compulsive loops may entail letting go of a part of our own being. If we want to experiment with different forms of life, if we want to develop heterotopic and critical practices, we may need to learn how to face our own cyber death. The me that is part of the loop needs to die, to slip out of the endless circularity of loopy loops, even if just for a second, even if just for an intentional and intensive series of micro moments, micro moments. Today, we're unable to bear the weight of our own solitude. We hope the phone will never stop buzzing. Poke me or I die. Ding me or I die. Ding, ding, bzzz. Our heart rate should be measured in phone buzzes. Buzz in, buzz out. Buzz in, buzz out. The rhythms of our digital breathing techniques. While the psychopolitical digital infrastructure that I've tried quickly to describe has preceded, if not made possible, COVID-19, which of course does not mean that he created the virus or, or that there is no virus, maybe this pandemic is now pushing us to rethink our relationship with death and mortality, both inside and outside the digital sphere. And I say this considering how the biopolitical cosmology of the global north seems rest in, restlessly reluctant to do so. Thank you. Wow, thank you, Samueli. I knew your talk would be hypnotic, hilarious, and devastating at the same time. But I will say you have once again surpassed all expectations. You've just transported me through all six realms of the wheel of life uh, many times <laughs> in the past 15 minutes. I need to catch my breath, but thank you so much for this. Um, I'm really pleased to introduce um, our next speaker for the second half, uh, Dr. Vincent La Liberté, both an anthropologist and a psychiatrist from here at McGill. Vincent, we're really pleased to have you here. You have the floor. Okay, can you hear me now? Okay. Thank you very much for this opportunity to talk on this panel. Um, first, I'd like to say that what I'm about to present is not uh, my area of research. What I'll do is using my knowledge in anthropology and in psychiatry to shed an original light, I hope, on the pandemic, and especially on the impact of the measures that are taken to fight it. I will start with a parallel taken from the field of global health uh, that medical anthropologists have invested for the last uh, 30 years. Of course, global health is a very complex field and many books have been written about it. But there is one aspect that I believe any anthropologist would agree on, which is the following. Attempts to solve a health problem in another country, usually in the global south, can miss the mark or do more damage than good. Even when it's done with the best intention and backed by the most advanced science of the time. A classic example is the malaria eradication program conducted by the World Health Organization after World War II. I'm taking this example from the book Reimagining Global Health, edited by Paul Farmer, Jim Young Kim, Arthur Kleinman, and Matthew Basilico. This program was built on the new discovery, the antibiotic and pesticide DDT, so powerful that it supported the belief that it would be possible to eradicate the illness by spreading this chemical inside every home. The program failed in many countries for a variety of reasons. I won't enumerate them all, 
but there was practical issues of accessing house in remote area or the fact that mosquitoes develop resistance. More fundamentally, it was understood that controlling the disease would never work if you don't transform the living condition of people and address issues that keep peasant farmer in poverty, such as land tenant agreements, for example. Without resources, peasant cannot drain their land and prevent the breeding of mosquitoes. And much later, we discovered that DDD was presenting important health hazards. The main lesson from this historical event is that top-down approach to health may not work. The choice of DDT as an intervention was also in the interest of the donator, which arrived a lot in top-down approach. Another problem that comes back in global health is that people who make intervention build metrics in order to assess the efficacy of an, an intervention. Um, and these metrics only captures part of reality. We know that large scale intervention always have unintended consequence, given that predicting the result of our action in an eco-social world is just too complex. And it has been the task of uh, medical anthropologists in global health to try to embrace its complexity, partner with local people and to help design intervention that are as uh, appropriate culturally as possible. So you probably see me coming now. Um, I think that the wisdom uh, gathered in global health applies very well to the current pandemic. The disease and the impact of our intervention is also measured through specific metrics that are broadcast in the media across the globe every day. The number of COVID positive cases, beds in the hospital that are taken and the number of deaths. Even though we can hope that the intention behind these interventions are the best one and that we use all our scientific knowledge about the disease. I wonder if we have done a careful assessment of the consequences of the intervention on our social world. Of course, when the state of emergency was declared in our country in early March, we needed to act in a unified way. But now that weeks, months have passed, it's essential to start to make those analyses that we have learned to do in medical anthropology. And that's what I want to do with the remaining of this presentation. I want to look at other variables that are affected by confinement and social isolation measure. They are not part of the official metrics, but perhaps we should integrate them, even if they are harder to measure. First, I would like to talk about some of the mental health consequences of lockdown and social isolation. And then I want to talk about how these measures affect much more the individual who are facing, uh, who are already facing precarity. Psychiatric epidemiological studies have shown that poverty is one of the most important factors in developing all sorts of mental health problems. We know that the lockdown is leading us to a major economic recession, and we have every reason to believe that it will trigger depression, anxious disorder, drug and alcohol abuse, domestic violence, and suicide. In addition, massive job loss have already occurred. And a study published in Lancet Psychiatry in 2015 by Carlos Nord and colleagues using global data showed a link between unemployment and suicide following the 2008 economic crisis. This association was confirmed in many other studies and it showed that uh, uh, men in working age were especially at risk. The consequence of poverty on children's mental health that could uh, be that up to three times, they would be more likely to suffer from a psychiatric condition is also alarming. And this, this highlights another problem. How do we compare the lifelong consequence of poverty on a child, which is very hard to measure and almost impossible, on the actual death metric that we are being shown? Psychiatric epidemiology research, and to be honest, a bunch of TED Talks, uh, are also clear about the fact that social ties and social support are, are some of the most important protective factors uh, against mental illness. Um, in the Framingham study, the famous one, where individuals are followed for more than 70 years, it was shown that one of the best predictors of health and happiness was the quality of social relations. We also know that 
social isolation triggers inflammatory reaction in the body and that it predicts many physical illness and mortality. It seems that at the core, we're social beings. Um, another mental health consequence that we are aware of is the link between anxiety disorder and the use of social media, which was already alarming before the pandemic. According to uh, Jonathan Haidt, social psychologist, this would be especially worrisome among teenagers and young adults, the group being the most at, at risk being teenage girls. So I wonder if this was factored in, in when we hear about bringing education to online platform in the fall in university, but also in high school. And another hard to measure metrics, I think, um, would be that uh, um, group experience, such as religious one, artistics, or even those that we can obtain through sport, are probably not something accessory, but rather fundamental to human life, since it has been part of every culture. So I don't know what is the what are the mental health consequences of interrupting these activities in prolongated way for artists, but for everyone. Another aspect that uh, anthropologists are concerned about concerned about is what they refer to as structural violence. And in the context of global health, it can mean that people are affected different differently by intervention according to their social positioning. I will briefly use another example from the book Reimagining Global Health, the construction of the Peligre Dam in 1956 in Haiti that was helped and funded by US company with the goal of bringing electricity to Port-au-Prince. Well, it was discovered that the poor village were flooded, often, un often uninformed of the, of the, of the, of the dam which led to many water refugees. And also in the capital, it seems that poor residents were much less likely to receive electricity for, for, from the dam. So I'd like to make the argument that it is also people already experiencing precarity who are suffering the most from this forced interruption of social life and work and, on the, and of the concomitant zoomification of social life. And I'd like to base my reflection on my um, experience working with homeless people in Montreal as a psychiatrist. Uh, we also know that the proportion of First Nation immigrants and refugees has increased a lot in the homeless population in recent years, which also compound this structural inequalities. So for many homeless people, um, and this is, these are my observations based on uh, experience on the ground and talking with people um, I would say that life for homeless people has become more complicated since the pandemic, harder. For example, pen handling is more challenging. Um, people no longer want to open their, the window of their car, for example, because they're afraid. Uh, physical money can be used in stores. Selling cans was impossible for a while, I'm not sure now. Uh, in addition, place where homeless people used to uh, hang out uh, such uh, are now closed. For example, restaurants such as Tim Horton, McDonald. Many uh, injection sites are closed. And uh, seeing a doctor for a homeless person was already challenging, but becomes nearly impossible when the only way to do so is through internet, if you don't have access to it. And uh, also, when we look at the broader picture of homelessness, uh, when there was an attempt to confine everyone, it soon became obvious in many cities across America and Europe that homeless people caused a problem because they had nowhere to confine. Hence, they became seen as a potential vector of disease, which I think increased the stigma against this population. And it's possible to see that the important political actions that were taken in several cities were a response to this threat. Yes, there is a positive side to this. Uh, in Montreal, it was impressive to see how with just a little political will in a few weeks and even days, the abandoned Royal Victoria Hospital could be turned into a COVID positive uh, homeless uh, hospital, which I've heard uh, is working very well and very uh, humanly. Uh, also, a couple of uh, hotels uh, were turned into shelter almost instantly. 
However, so, so there's, this is the positive side. We can see how we just with political will, things can change. However, uh, to go to this hotel, homeless people need to be tested negative, and then they have to stay there 23 out of 24 hours with supervised pause outside in which they have to respect the two meter social distancing. So for many, the street or freedom is preferable to such a life. I'd like to conclude with some thoughts, uh, probably more experimental, uh, that are linked to what I was working on prior to the start of the pandemic. I spent the last year with horsemen in Montreal as an anthropologist. And as most of you are probably aware, they have been banned from Montreal as of this year. And there was the naive belief, I would say, that you could just unroot these people from what they have been doing for decades and help them find new job with jobs with specific program or give them money for their horse and that things would go fine. But it did not work like this. When January 1st arrived, a lot of them became confined at home or homeless without their purpose and struggling a lot. What I'd like to suggest is that what we call mental health or meaningful life is not simply something that occurs inside our head or in our psychology. It's rather something that emerged out of our relation with the outside world that include other people as well as animal and nature. And this is true for everyone. Without daily social interaction with many people and, I, and by instead spending too much time on screen, we're much likely to feel disconnected and develop unhealthy stories about ourselves, about the world, and perhaps we'll call those stories mental disease. To summarize, I'm not saying I have an answer to what we should do with this pandemic. I am rather attempting to do what any medical anthropologist would do in a global health setting. And what is this if not a global health situation? The anthropologist would look at the local consequences of the intervention we're putting in place and wonder if we're really improving people's life. He or she would reflect on the metrics being used, talk to people on the ground, partner with them to see what they value and how they want to solve the problem. And then they will try to bring this information to everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much, Vincent, for bringing to the discussion a great number of really important, often marginalized realities that have mostly been left out of the public conversation. And thank you also for bringing to our attention how positive things uh, can emerge from pandemics. When, for example, a crisis prompts a shift in public attention, which then leads us to help people that we were uh, forgetting. So thank you for this. Um, I am pleased, excited to introduce uh, our next speaker, Dr. Danny Frank, a psychiatrist and psychoanalyst at the Jewish General Hospital, uh, who will bring some, I think, much needed psychoanalytic perspectives on uh, the pandemic and the crisis. So thank you, Danny, for joining us today. You have the floor. You might need to turn on your mic, please. Okay, do you hear me now? Okay. So thank you, Sam. I'm very happy to be here. I find the discussion extremely stimulating. Um, and I noticed that this is uh, put on by McGill's uh, Cultural Mind and Brain Organization. And uh, I think my discussion is gonna be uh, a bit different than the others because I'm gonna look at the mind part more than the cultural part, more than uh, the sociological part more than the digital part and so on. Uh, I liked uh, Sam's initial talk about pre-existing comorbidities. I'm gonna to try to talk about them and current comorbidities in the mind that affect how we experience this pandemic. Um, and when professors Dingwall and X had a little disagreement about what, it, what has happened until now, <clears throat> I think most people do feel that without me going into that, because I know virtually nothing about it, that we were not really prepared worldwide and I think one of the reasons we were not prepared worldwide is the idea that there could be a pandemic with such horrible effects is frightening to people and they suppress it and they deny it, which is a psychological mechanism. So I, I wanna look at human nature and how human nature may fit into the, uh, the discussion today. So uh, I thought of uh, the title that uh, I would say psychoanalytic takes on COVID is the attacker in the outside world or is it inside of us? 
And of course, that's nonsensical because of course it's both. Uh, and I wanted to start with some humility. Uh, Galileo insulted us by establishing that the earth goes around the sun, not vice versa. Darwin insulting us, insulted us by telling we come from the apes. Freud insulted, insulted us by uh, establishing we are importantly unaware of ourselves. And COVID further insults us by confronting us with our ignorance, our smallness, and our relative irrelevance in the universe. These viruses, which are unseen, unheard, unknown, are in a, a hidden liminal world. It's all around us, it's inside us. Uh, we run into it by, by accident, it's like a first earth. Uh, and, and these viruses are alive, but not quite alive. The, the, the analogy, there's an analogy in spi phoenix, sorry, physics to uh, dark matter and dark energy. We don't understand very much about them. And so how can we not feel diminished and frightened and mystified by what has happened suddenly? Uh, so, the, uh, and by the way, I just a uh, side note about biology because uh, the, mind, the brain is in here in terms of biology, the viruses are crucial to us having immunological systems. And even the immunological systems are very hard to understand because of the mystery of autoimmune conditions. But anyway, to go back to, uh, to the mind, uh, I'm drawing an analogy between the virus and the unconscious mind uh, in terms of what's unknown and what's scary. Uh, our unconscious mind knows certain things, but also highlights how much we, how little we know about ourselves. In, in science, we have no idea. We have none, not, the, not a clue to know how, if I ask you how much is two and two, and you know in your head, that it's four in your mind, that it's four, we have no idea how our mind does that in terms of neurochemistry and neurophysiology and not even a conceptual way of approaching it that uh, people agree, agree up, upon, uh, including the, the famous uh, current uh, integrated information model that's been promulgated. So to come to the question of what does analysis contribute to COVID, uh, these concepts are, are kind of a beginning uh, in terms of humility and ignorance. We don't understand the epidemiology, the virology. We don't understand enough about our reactions to it. And I'm not speaking about opening or closing the economy. That's not my uh, talk at all. I'm not speaking of the fact that mental health suffers, as Vincent mentioned. Some of my schizophrenic patients don't even know there's a pandemic going on. And they don't pay attention to their personal hygiene. They are uh, at extra risk, by the way. Uh, I just had to put that in. I'm not speaking of what Vincent said about anxiety, depression, suicide, uh, spousal uh, abuse, and things like that. Uh, but then I think during the Blitz in London, the suicide rate went down. What's that about? It's a very fascinating phenomenon. Um, we know that some people, both patients and non-patients, the rest of us, feel terrible and worse with this pandemic. And some people actually feel better. Some people feel relieved to be left alone, to have a rationale, to be isolated and socially distanced as they always are. And now they have more of a rationalization to be, to be so. And some people, of course, feel t terrible about it. So what I'm saying is that we need Rather than make broad scale generalizations about anxiety and suicide going up, and we need to know more about the individual's response to what's going on here. Uh, because pe no two people are alike, and people react to external trauma in a, a resilient way sometimes or in a pathological way sometimes. And that's that what accounts for these differences. Um, and so, in that sense, I'm speaking about the, the unknown virus in our mind. Um, a well-known uh, psychodynamic researcher named Sidney Blatt, who died about a year ago, established human differences between those people who are very um, uh, motivated, geared, run by attachment to others. He called it an anaclytic reaction to others, as opposed to those people who are more uh, introjective and self-critical. And there's a very large body of research supporting his concepts. So depending on what kind of personality you have, let's say you are in one of those two dimensions or another, you tend toward one or the other, that will change your reaction both to the virus and to being socially isolated. That, that's really quite important. 
I would, uh, psychoanalysis is very complicated. I just want to say that I think that for me, one crucial issue that affects me and everybody I know and everything I read about has to do with guilt. Uh, guilt is a kind of, uh, an, and there's different kinds of guilt, but guilt is an anxiety in which that comes when we feel aggressive or angry at somebody we depend on, somebody we need. And that leads us to the, also to talk about the difference between external and internal reality, which is really the, the subject of my, my thought. Guilt is usually handled by deflecting it to the outside world, to the external reality. There's not to say that external reality doesn't exist, of course, but guilt is, is dealt with often that way. So that many people's perspectives, thoughts, and feelings about COVID are to, to externalize it to that damn virus that might kill us, or to China, or to Trump, or to the poor blacks, or to the rich whites, or, or, and, and so on. This is uh, to our uh, pathetic uh, political and social realm. And then what about real existential guilt? So if we're thinking of guilt, we have to distinguish between real guilt, like why have we let Syrians suffer the way they have, or the women in many countries in the world, or the Kurds, et cetera, et cetera. What are we doing about that? Or this terrible commercial I see on TV about these pathetic dogs and they want money for the SBCA, which you know pulls at your heart. So that, that's, ex that's the external reality. Uh, so there is this dialect between the inner world and the outer world, which is endlessly fascinating. One of the things about the outer world that's relevant in analysis is that people have to realize what is possible as opposed to what is impossible and what's permitted and what's forbidden. And knowing those things, can, uh, being able to, construct, uh, to confront external reality sometimes relieves people's guilt. It calms them down to know what's possible and what's impossible and what's permitted and what, what's not permitted. So this interdigitation between the outer world and the inner world for me is endlessly fascinating. I, I'm, I'm going to stop here because uh, I go beyond my competence, but just one little uh, doffing my hat of respect to external reality, I'll quote Woody Allen. He said, after he had a long analysis, he said, I hate external reality. He learned that, he learned that from his anal, analyst's emphasis on his internal reality. He said, where else can you get a good steak? So with, with that little joke, I think I'll, I'll end my talk. Thank you so much, Daniel. It's really important that you bring that up. Uh, a few of you here, I think, were at a SPA meeting the other day when a psychiatrist mentioned that initially, some of her um, schizophrenic patients reported feeling better and the beginning of the pandemic because external reality appeared to match the sense of doom in their internal reality. And I also like how you point out the sort of metaphysical, almost existential nature of the threat posed by viruses. This is the really important food for thought. So we are on schedule. Uh, we're ahead of schedule. This is great. I am pleased to introduce uh, our last speaker for the day, uh, Professor Lawrence Kermeyer, uh, director of the division here. Professor Kermeyer needs no introduction. Um, I'm very glad you could join us. Thank you. You have the floor. Thank you very much, Samuel. Thank you to all the colleagues and all the other participants in this meeting, which is succeeding beyond, I think, all of our hopes in terms of having a really rich and um, important colloquy among people. Um, I uh, wanted to return to some, uh, some issues that uh, frame a lot of the discussion and that I think are important for us at this moment. So, uh, and I'm gonna use some slides, um, probably so I don't have to stare at myself on the, on the screen here. So hang on one second, I'm gonna have to change to screen sharing. And then I'm going to launch this thing here. And then I just need to know, yeah, I'm sharing my desktop. And you'll let me know in a second if this is actually working here. There we go. Okay, can you see my screen? See the slides? Yes? Okay. 
so my talk is called Science and Sanity. I'll explain that just in a moment. But in the focus, though, is on a set of questions around social epistemology that I think are really highlighted by the current uh, pandemic. Um, the question of epistemology um, comes to us on many levels, starting with what we think the object of concern and inquiry is in the case of the pandemic. Is it the, the virus as we can see it with electron microscopy or as we can imagine it uh, with the tools of um, uh, molecular biology? Uh, uh, is it uh, some kind of a historical predicament that we're in that needs to be put against the backdrop of previous and future pandemics? Uh, or is it a set of relationships uh, that are put into play in a particularly vivid way because of the, the current predicament? And it's that latter that I especially want to talk about because I think that uh, the new normal uh, phrase that we've used for this uh, today's uh, seminar and I hope for some other ones that we'll have um, contains a bit of a paradox. Uh, first of all in the sense that new makes it sound like we're dealing with something novel and singular and unique and it has I guess in, in terms of um, um, consumer capitalism a very positive quality. We all want new things, the latest and the best and so on. And normal stands for normalization in this case, I guess, and a process of hiding the production of everydayness. Um, the first few days of being in confinement were definitely novel. Uh, and then as things go on for months, they take on a very different quality, but not necessarily something that's entirely in the background. All of this, this, this situation we find ourselves in uh, is underwritten by a set of claims about what's going on. Uh, what's the right way to respond? Um, how should we understand uh, the different kinds of information, the info, uh, infodemic or the info glut that we're, that we're facing? Uh, and so that's what, I guess, speaks to a set of epistemic questions that I'm interested in here, which are not about science per se, but about the public relationship to science uh, and all of our relationship to the different kinds of influence, the different sources of information, of possibility, and indeed uh, the basis on which uh, governments and local authorities and individuals are struggling to make uh, a variety of, of crucial decisions. So these are some of the sort of epistemic questions I want to put on the table. There won't be time to address any of these in particular in any depth. I just want to highlight over the next few minutes some of the ways in which the current uh, pandemic raises epistemic questions that we should be thinking about and that we need to um, uh, to work on and to come to some deeper understanding through the tools of social science of, um, uh, to, to help us going forward. Uh, my, my overall title uh, is a nod to uh, this uh, figure, Alfred Korzybski, uh, a uh, scientist, philosopher, engineer uh, in uh, the mid, uh, mid 20th century, uh, who wrote uh, a book called Science and Sanity. Uh, in which he argued for something he called general semantics, which was an attempt to understand how we come to know things and what some of the basic biases are in how humans construct the world. Uh, and in so doing, to develop a kind of um, uh, mental hygiene. And indeed, he published articles as an article on the left in the American Journal of Psychiatry that he published prior to his uh, opus magnum for this book, uh, arguing that if we understand that uh, we are using language or using maps of reality. Reality is not in those words. It's not in our language. It's something else. And we are always only dealing with fragments of that. We can develop uh, more careful habits of thought that prevent us from being sort of mesmerized by our own constructs. So I'm invoking Korzybski for a variety of reasons. I'll come back to it at the end, but I should mention that you can already see the, the, by the book and the way it's presented and um, some of the things around this that this is somewhere on the edge of, of um, uh, meaningful philosophy and science and uh, somewhat, uh, we could say, grandiose uh, uh, system building. Uh, but the way that I encountered this philosophy was actually through science fiction, uh, because the science fiction writer A.E. Van Vaught wrote a whole series of books on Korzybski's non-Aristotelian philosophy uh, as a kind of 
almost superpower that people could have, that people could develop in the future a kind of rationality that would allow them to do extraordinary things. Uh, and in fact, not only allow them to adapt and deal with the everyday world, but to develop a political system, uh, ultimately that could, uh, in fact, uh, allow a form of sociality, although the central uh, um, uh, structure of the narrative of these books is about oppressive use of a, a system of, of um, testing people for their rationality, which would then assign them uh, a place in society. So the backdrop then of, of Korzybski talking about how to develop habits of thought that will make us more rational, and the insights of contemporary uh, social studies of science uh, and sociology of science that have argued for social epistemology, basically insisting that what goes on in ways of knowing is not only cognitive, it's not only located within the individual, but it's located in the social world, in relationships between people, in transactions, in forms of life, as Wittgenstein would put it, uh, that we can unpack with the tools of social science to talk about in terms of social structure and process, in terms of culture, in terms of social niches, in terms of community, and indeed in terms of politics of knowledge and power. So all the tools we have coming from different social um, theories allow us to think more more deeply about what these processes of social epistemology are. And so this is the backdrop then to uh, asking what are the epistemic problems that are on display in the current uh, pandemic predicament as we're all receiving information, whether it's from compulsively reading New York Times in the morning or watching um, breaking news every two seconds on CNN or whatever kind of source uh, of information we're relying on, uh, what is going on in the circulation of ideas that we're trying to um, somehow uh, find our way through. So one thing that's happening is that, as I already alluded to, uh, news sources and internet sources and indeed our friends are all mobilizing certain kinds of cues to attract our attention, to tell us this is what you should pay attention to. This is important, this is urgent, this demands uh, your full attention and this demands some form of action in some ways. You need to change your life. Um, and this is occurring in uh, Broadway in every facet of life, but I want to hone in on four aspects. In a sense, these are smaller problems or specific areas that display the, the issues that I think are, are, we're beset with and that we have to think our way through. And so these have to do with our notion of what's going on in different ways. In particular, what's the scale of the problem? How big a problem is this? Should we really be alarmed? Is it going to affect all of us? And so on. The second is, uh, where does this problem come from? How we tend to try to understand action, and certainly in the areas of science and technology and medicine, we're very committed to trying to understand some forms of causality as a way of getting to the root of the problem and deciding what we really should be doing. How does that, how is that account being generated? And again, how do we warrant that? The third area I'll touch on briefly is what should we do to prevent this? Is it possible to avoid this problem? What do we need to do? And thirdly, what should we do to treat this? And as you all already know, just from this bare bones list, all of these have been hugely contentious, highly politicized, uh, and extremely problematic for uh, all of us to make sense of and to decide what's, what's a sober and, and uh, adaptive thing to do in, in a given situation. So as I alluded to at the beginning, these are not new problems. Sorting these things out in any domain of life has been with us for a very long time, but the current pandemic and the drastic changes people have been enjoying to make throw these issues into high relief. And they occur at a particular point in time, and I'll try to say again briefly uh, some of what's going on in all these situations. So first of all, uh, how big is the problem? It turns out, this seems like a very simple thing to do. We should just count how many people are affected, and we do indeed get daily reports of the numbers. And, but this turns out to be an extremely difficult thing to do, and potentially very misleading thing to do, uh, because uh, there may be many cases in a very large country, but that might be a very small proportion of the population. But in fact, uh, to, this day, to this moment, most of the figures we have are not that meaningful uh, because they don't involve um, actual random samples of representative populations. They are based on clinical populations. They're based on people who have symptoms. Uh, and so we are really getting a little keyhole view into what might be going on. And every day we hear more about there are lots of people out there who are asymptomatic. So the actual number of people who've been affected by the vir virus might be enormous. And this has big implications. It means the death rate might be very high or it might be quite low. 
Uh, and in fact, you know, the more information we get, the more it tends in that direction, because if anything, the bias would be toward having a small, too small a denominator uh, initially because of people um, coming to attention, at least in those countries where there are healthcare systems that people are being um, corralled within and where there are, uh, there's testing available. It's not the same situation in some of the most populous parts of the world, uh, like India or different parts of Africa, where we don't have much of a clue of, of what's going on uh, to this uh, to this date. Uh, the other interesting issue that goes on in complexity, I guess, in trying to produce these kinds of numbers is uh, that when efforts are made to circumvent the problem of testing uh, and, and of sampling and just look at overall death rates in a region uh, and show that in fact, taking the US as an example, you can show a very large excess mortality in many parts of the country over the period of the pandemic. And it's plausible to attribute that in some ways to the effects of the pandemic. Uh, it remains that that may not be a significant chunk of that excess mortality may not be caused by viral infection directly. It might be caused by people not going in for medical care and dying at home or dying of problems that could have been uh, treated. It might be caused uh, perhaps a, a, another unknown proportion by some of the rigors and stresses associated with mitigation efforts. Uh, so that figure of excess mortality is legitimately related to the pandemic, but not uh, necessarily related to the infectious problem of the pandemic. So it needs to be thoroughly unpacked. So this is just a, uh, an example of how we're, on the one hand, we're impressed by these figures and alarmed by these figures. And we all get here in Montreal, which is the sort of Canadian uh, epicenter of, of, of the, uh, of the uh, pandemic, uh, we get daily statistics from our hospital, from the region, and so on, a number of cases, and they certainly have uh, an impact just on, on sheer magnitude, but interpreting them is actually quite difficult in terms of what they mean. Second issue has to do with origin stories, and as you know, this has been really fraught and heavily politicized, um, and, and I think it's, it's worth remembering that most uh, uh, cultural uh, systems have a body of myths that are center, centered on questions of origin, that this is you know, a, a preoccupation for human beings, making sense of where we come from and where we're going. And uh, myth making goes on around that, and indeed that happens in this setting. We do have a technolo technologies that can tell us with some measure of confidence where things came from by tracing uh, genetics and, and uh, genetic markers. And so we're, that's data is kind of beginning to appear. And it's on that basis largely that people are able to say with some confidence uh, where this virus began uh, and counter some of the uh, conspiracy theories and other things that I'll mention in a moment. Uh, but the reality is that where the virus came from is not or, and the virus itself is not the simple cause of the disease because any disease, any infectious disease is the result of an interaction between the vector and the host. And so it turns out that uh, not everybody responds to COVID the same way. In fact, the evidence is that most people have mild symptoms and many people never even know that they were infected. Uh, the people who have catastrophic effects are uh, probably dealing with uh, vagaries of their own immune system, uh, both in terms of under activity and not protecting them, or as we know in the case of children and some other uh, examples of complications, over activities. Danny was just alluding to that we're dealing with uh, things like a cytokine storm, we're dealing with different kinds of immune responses that are actually what's killing people. So the picture, the, the sort of naive monocausal picture, it's in the virus, let's look at that picture of the virus, let's fight the virus, is an inadequate picture of what goes on in this as in any infectious disease. Uh, moreover, that kind of uh, biological explanation is not satisfying for many people. Many people feel like there must be some kind of malevolent agency behind this. If the story of the virus just becomes, here's this little machine, uh, you know, as simple, about as simple as life can get, uh, and uh, it doesn't care one whit one way or the other about us, it's just trying to optimize its own reproduction, uh, that... Other, most people find that not very satisfying, would much rather think that somebody sitting in a laboratory somewhere has constructed this, uh, then there's somebody to blame, uh, there's some sort of target for our emotion and so on. I'll, I'll come back to that briefly. 
And the third area where we can see these epistemic questions playing out in both an emotionally intense way and in a way that has profound implications for civil society has to do with prevention strategies. Because given the absence of treatment and the likelihood it'll be some time before we have either effective prevention or effective treatment, uh, the immediate strategies of prevention in the form of vaccine, let's say, the immediate strategies have to do with social distancing, uh, and with managing the potential of the infection. And it's quite striking to see how different uh, societies, different places have responded to this. I was just had a call earlier today with a colleague, Soma Ganesan, a psychiatrist who works in Vancouver, and who's been uh, just recently in February was in Vietnam and uh, working with different uh, South Asian countries, uh, where uh, the idea of following um, um, public health restrictions on activity uh, are, is not viewed as a profound abrogation of one's civil rights uh, and sort of prompting one to sort of, you know, wear signs that say, don't tread on me and, and uh, put on one's uh, body armor and, and, uh, and uh, assault rifle and, and go visit the state capitol. But clearly in, in some other uh, parts of the world, these, um, and, uh, the social meaning of these limitations on action is quite profound. And I think um, uh, there's no counterbalance to that sense of the social injustice of um, having to restrict one's activity, no counterbalance coming from a sense of the urgency or seriousness of the public health measure for some people. The final point, let me, let me just... Um, um, so that was just a robo call from some part of the world. So we're now part of the other aspect of this uh, digital uh, network that we're all embedded in. Um, okay, last point. Uh, the question of what works and what we what would be prudent to do in this situation. And again, there are notorious examples just in the last few weeks uh, with the U.S. president uh, somewhat uh, uh, um, uh, perplexingly uh, advising that people take uh, um, disinfectants internally or they, they could somehow get UV light into their insides. Um, uh, but many people uh, are confident that uh, what they've heard from their friends or from other people or from a small clinical trial is quite adequate to decide um, you know, that this is a thing worth doing. Uh, and I think that speaks to the fact that people don't recognize how almost everything works under some circumstances, either because things are going to get better anyway. We've already alluded to the fact that most people with COVID are probably asymptomatic or going to have mild symptoms and get better, or because, in fact, positive expectations and things you, you do have some kind of effect on the course of things. For those reasons, we need clinical trials. Uh, that's a major epistemic advance to develop ways of looking carefully at, at how things work and what might be going on. Uh, but uh, as I say, there's not really wide understanding of this. And in many people's cases, this is just a deferral to a uh, kind of medical authority. And you can see this very clearly when you look at the iconoclastic figures who've been embraced. Uh, here they are from two different uh, domains of, of healthcare. Uh, on the left is Dr. Vladimir Zelenko, uh, who works in upstate New York, uh, and I think he, he's uh, involved with providing primary care to a Hasidic community there. And he decided that uh, hydroxychloroquine, azithromycin, and zinc uh, is a, um, a cure for, uh, or a surefire prevention for. Uh, for COVID-19, uh, and uh, he's been widely embraced by a number of people. And on the right, you have uh, one of the, um, probably the virologist with the highest impact factor of anyone in the world, but who also is a studied iconoclast uh, who decided on the basis of a small, poorly done uh, a trial uh, that um, hydroxychloroquine works uh, and is now um, uh, promoting that. So you have people who represent a kind of science uh, and a kind of uh, medical evidence-based medical practice in both cases who are, I would say, falling prey to some of their own epistemic biases and, and, and wishful thinking. Uh, this occurs in the context where all kinds of things are circulating on the web. And this is just stuff that one particular friend has sent me who's caught up in this, uh, these things. Uh, and it has to do with uh, observations, the uh, claims that the coronavirus has uh, pieces of HIV uh, DNA, uh, RNA inserted into it, or that um, actually uh, hydroxychloroquine definitely will work and it costs pennies, but nobody wants you to have a cheap treatment because people stand to make millions of dollars on 
uh, expensive treatments, uh, and on and on and on with more and more complicated uh, conspiracy theories. So what this raises now, and this is where I'm, I'm kind of heading and I'm going to end, uh, is what's new about these uh, pandemic epistemics? What are some of the new parameters uh, that we need to be studying and making sense of through the tools of social science and our own reflection? The first is that, uh, and we can use this partly by asking what's different now than what was then during the, uh, the influenza uh, pandemic uh, century ago. Uh, the first is we have a fabulously refined technology of bioscience, so we can actually produce lots of information, uh, some of which is very illuminating. So we can do, for example, uh, the tracking of the, the RNA and say uh, the people who got infected in one place probably got it from certain other places because we're looking at small variations uh, in the, uh, in the uh, genome of the, of the virus. Um, the biggest thing, and many of uh, us have been talking about it today, is the role of the internet and social media in the circulation of ideas, in the way they're framed, the way they're presented. And this is happening uh, just in terms of a kind of dynamics of information flow. It's happening in terms of the psychological dynamics of identity, who we feel connected to, who we trust. Uh, and it's happening at the level of community. Uh, and again, there, I think there are lots of things to be looking at. Changes in our sense of temporality. Samuel Collier really very dramatically both embodied and enacted this for us, as well as pointing to it, the profound changes in temporality that come uh, with uh, spending time online, uh, with our sense of the immediacy of the threat, the virus, uh, and, and so on. Uh, changes in social structure because of how we're connected, not only more widely interconnected, but also disconnected, balkanized, caught in our own bubbles so that we don't have to contend with uh, a fuller range of information. And changes in political economy in which um, uh, the resources that we have access to, what we think we need, what we, we, we desperately do need, are being increasingly controlled uh, in ways that uh, have profound influence for our life. All this is occurring against this political changes of the rise of populism. And for me, Danny referred to sort of the, you know, the, the psychodynamic issues uh, of dealing with threat and uh, process of denial. I think that there is a larger threat that lies behind COVID uh, that drives this anxiety. And I think that's the threat of climate catastrophe and uh, the, the end of, of uh, hum human existence as we know it. And I think that idea has seemed very far away and very distant and very abstract to a lot of people. And I think that in some ways the infection seems very close and immediate. Uh, and for a variety of reasons. And I think that some of what's driving the anxiety now and some of what this is a kind of um, uh, run through, a kind of uh, uh, dress rehearsal for, uh, even in terms of erecting barriers and, and uh, keeping people out and so on, is this much larger uh, catastrophe that we're facing. So where that leads us is to the urgent need for us to be thinking through the intersection of politics, of ecology, and of human values. Um, Robert uh, Dingwall referred earlier to René Dubois, very important in this context because of his insistence that we are never going to get rid of all these viruses and infectious agents. We coexist with them. They're going to continue to evolve. Uh, there's no biology, biological picture in which we can imagine that we would totally master all of these, uh, these entities, and we have to develop some kind of a rapprochement, and, which is going to constantly bring up, us up against our limits. Uh, Another social thinker who's made the argument, very pertinent to the present, present moment, that the way that uh, international uh, capitalism, the current economic system works, is by capitalizing on disaster. And we can certainly see that happening in many profound ways right now that should be deeply disturbing to us. And then finally, I guess a ray of hope, a ray of uh, light for those of us who believe that we can think more clearly about these things, suggestion from the sociology of science, uh, that actually science, scientific thinking, the effort to think things through clearly, has certain virtues uh, that can not only give us a clear picture of what's going on, but actually underwrite forms of social life, perhaps like the discussions we're having today, in which we listen to each other, in which we uh, weigh seriously what people have to say, in which we try to have a certain kind of openness and a certain kind of critical thinking and a certain kind of scrupulousness uh, in our discussions. So that's where I'm going to end. Uh, I thank all of you um, because uh, this is, uh, I guess, uh, an enactment of exactly that kind of uh, process that we're referring to. And i um, glad to turn this back to Samuel. Thank you so much, everyone. I see myself frozen on screen. Can people hear me? 
Yeah, okay. Uh, thank you, Lawrence. And I really like your idea of uh, your, your hypothesis of a sort of a, of a delayed shock syndrome, uh, really bringing uh, to light a sense of collectively impending doom that was really about, about something else. And I think you've also bri brilliantly illustrated the many ways in which the current crisis is also an epistemic crisis and one that is shedding light on what we might call pre-existing um, epistemic pathologies. So, so thank you and thank you again, everyone. Um, I'm going to soon turn it over to uh, Dr. Lisa Solomonova from here at McGill, who's both uh, a philosopher and a neuroscientist. Uh, Dr. Sol Solomonova has uh, graciously accepted to be the uh, discussant and moderator. Uh, in discussing that, the moderation, uh, Lisa and I agreed that uh, we might take a really short, not 10, but maybe five minute quick uh, break. Uh, and in the meantime, people can continue to organize their thoughts and, and perhaps volunteer more questions. Um, Lisa, was there anything you, you wanted to add about uh, instructions? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, well, first of all, I just, I just wanted to thank everybody for this event. It has been really, amazing to listen to all these perspectives and you know i've been taking notes of a bunch of uh really fundamental themes that have come up there's a lot to think about a lot to talk about so i do propose that we take a five minute break so that everybody can formulate the thoughts a little bit perhaps ask questions i'm going to maybe share a screen sam is that okay yeah okay um i'm gonna share a screen this this one here just sec Right. So this is this is this is the 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 platform that I propose we use for the questions. If you uh, if, if if people who want to ask questions could please go to slido.com and then answer just 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 enter this number and put your questions here. As you can see, we already have a bunch of questions, and then what I will do, I will uh, I will select the ones that are kind of like, you know, perhaps most upvoted or most relevant, and uh, depending on how the discussion goes, uh, I can select the next relevant one from the questions uh, here with, um, uh, with, with, with help of everybody. And uh, we do suggest that you, you ask any sort of questions that can be directed to specific speakers or to the panel uh, at large in general. So uh, let's take a five minute break. So that would be, um, I, don't, I don't have to time on the screen. Yeah, 4.22, so 4.27, uh, if we can come back. Thank you. So Samuel, is this, is this time? Oh, <clears throat> okay. I, I don't hear you, but I saw your uh, thumbs up. Yes, please, you now, the floor is all yours. Okay. Okay, well, okay, so w welcome back everyone. And please, uh, please, please don't hesitate to use the, the online platform for questions. The, the reason to use that is just it's a little bit simpler than keeping track of uh, comments in, in the Zoom window. And it is hard with so many participants to just have people speak up. So um, again, uh, a million thanks <clears throat> to all the presenters. This has been really really stimulating um so i'm just going to i'm not going to take a lot of time uh, myself but i'm going to just just have some some remarks of my own about uh how how interesting it is that we've seen a certain kind of thread certain theme per permeate the discussion today and it really it all has to do with this kind of you know tension between the private life and the public life right the, the this kind of interactions that have always been there and now have become amplified, right? The, 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 the pre-existing pathologies have been often amplified to a degree that's really grotesque, right? So we, we heard from Samuel Kulu about how our sense of time has been completely disorganized in a way, right? Our addiction to technologies has become, you know, its own kind of thing. And I mean, me too, like I turn off my own video not to see myself on Zoom because it's just become unbearable to see myself see me seeing by others who either see me or just look at themselves which is really unclear. So uh, I really like the idea that we are all stuck in this, you know, loopy loops of addictive attachments uh, and live through stuff, uh, live through the period that's characterized by this kind of soup of guilt and denial and uh, moral kind of outrage and the, the, the struggle probably internal and external between Kind of what's what's right, you know, what's the right life, what's the right what's the right behavior, uh, the struggle as Cecilia Rousseau was talking about between righteousness and heroism. So there's a lot of archetypes here at play. But uh, just just one thing that I wanted to say is that um, 
as you know, as we're expected to be hyper productive during the pandemic, the first thing I did as soon as the lockdown started, I started a bunch of research studies. <laughs> and one and 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 so so just a, a small result that I wanted to share with everybody today, and I think maybe it's it's relevant to to this discussion. Uh, so uh, a lot of questions have been raised about what do what do people dream about during social lockdown during the pandemic, right? And so uh, a lot of the conversations were about well. You know, we're living under a state of threat, so it must be about threat, it must be about uh, stuff that we're missing, it must be about the disease, it must be about germs. What I have found, however, in the, in the, in the short questionnaire that I that I've administered online, is that people don't really dream, well, they do dream about that stuff, but don't really dream about that stuff. What people really dream about right now are themes of being inefficient, of themes of being kind of, you know, trying to do stuff and not, not achieving its goal, like trying, trying over and over something and not, not, not getting there, you know, failing an exam, arriving late. Those kind of themes seem to be predominant at the moment, which really exemplify this kind of, you know, the set of tensions that we've, that the speakers today have been talking about. That this is really an existential moment, not so much this like one specific, you know, uh, struggle against the disease or struggle against um, you know, even not even capitalism. So, but I want to, I want, I want to, I want to turn, uh, turn, um, turn to to the questions right now. Uh, and please, please continue posting them uh, on this platform. There, there's no reason why this platform is better than others. It's just it's it's easier to keep things in one place. Um, and I'm aware of the paradox. You know, as much as as much as we hate the technology, we end up you know just creating more accounts and all those different devices and you know different platforms for different things. So I'd like to just uh, maybe, yeah, maybe the first question that I that that I'd like to uh, to ask would be actually the first one asked in the on the platform is for Dr. Dingwall. Uh, so the question here that I've highlighted um, uh, says, you know, is our reliance on urban centers or in the move from deep green communities not correlated with the deter deterioration of our relations to death and nature? And I and I guess this is a, a big question about the urbanicity and what we talked about. Uh, previously about the the access to technology right like who who can do well in this pandemic who can have access to you know the zoomification of life uh, so so perhaps uh, dr dingwall we could start the discussion by answering uh, this this question oh well i can i can try it's a it's a very big question indeed um i suppose one of the things i would say is that the very first generation of sociologists and uh, anthropologists had this very romantic view of the, the countryside, of the village, of the pastoral life, um, really as a sort of hangover from the romanticism of early 19th century art and, and literature. And I think that this was something that they were playing off against the, their own experience of the rapid industrialization and urbanization of Europe. It was a very elitist vision. Um, they, they kind of missed the attractions of the cities to people who had grown up in the countryside and knew what rural poverty was like, knew what the problems of food availability were, the, you know, the, the harshness of, of life. Uh, you know, we look at, in, in the UK, we look at the, the beautiful country cottages that have been uh, that are now occupied by rich people in the Cotswolds, uh, about 40, 50 miles outside London. And, you know, our former prime ministers go there and write their memoirs. Um, but these were little more than the sort of mud huts of Africa at the time. And, the, you know, the migration into the cities in the course of the 19th century, in, uh, starting in, in the UK and, and gradually spreading throughout Europe, I mean, was... I mean, it was a major improvement, a major transformation in the lives of ordinary working people, uh, if you like, moving from mud huts to brick houses. Um, and it, it really was, I think, at that beginning of the 20th century that we get this reappraisal and a, an issue which, but it's an issue that continues to divide writers on society and thinkers about society. On the one hand, urbanization is it is the future. It's the temporal. It has the temporality of the future. Um, it's about. It is about innovation. It is about diversity. It is about moving from being the only person in your village who is like you to being part of a community of people who are like you. Um, 
and that becomes self-sustaining and it becomes innovative and it's one of the things that is deeply threatened by the by social distancing um, is that kind of diversity that kind of engagement that kind of innovation and I, i'm not sure that it necessarily correlates with a, a changing relationship to, to to nature i think if you scratch away behind the romanticism of a lot of 19th century writing you 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 find a deeply unsatisfactory relationship with nature you know nature is a very harsh mistress unless you're rich and living in a manor house and you can rearrange the countryside to to you to fit your taste um, so I, i'd be very careful about using a word like deterioration I think that you know there's a maybe a need to reevaluate, but I wouldn't want to go any further than that. Uh, thank you. Okay, so I thought I thought maybe I would stop sharing the screen so we can see more people, and I would pro I would I would also uh, maybe encourage people who do feel like they can uh, turn on their videos to just to just turn it on so we can feel a little bit more. Uh, I guess. A bit, a little bit more like emojis with hands, basically. <laughs> um, okay, so, all right. So, second, the second question that that I think uh, we can we can take from here is um, is a question I think directed to, uh, to Dr. Cecil Rousseau, um, and the question is how can we help those who are paralyzed with fear connect back to a sense of humanity and find a renewed meaning over our Fleeting identities. Uh, a question by Marcel, um, and I think this is um, this perhaps also can can tie into you know the kind of the way the way that we live in, in urban uh, centers uh, and complex societies. So I would say it's absolutely not a rhetorical question. It's, it's a very practical one. Now people are in fact terrified, not wanting to move out of confinement. So this is a, this is a very it's a, we've created a huge problem it will last for months uh two things do not work so presently uh coercion so forcing people to move out look at look at the the uh, huge conflict between unions and government uh so pushing people forcing people uh, gps family docs are overwhelmed with demands of letters uh uh, people asking for letters because they need to stay home. So first for medical reason, then for anxiety reasons. So all of that. So this is a so coercion. So forcing people is absolutely not um, working, and giving information is not working either. Why? Because because people are trying to reassure with information. But all of this information that we're eating every day is non-valid. What you listen in the morning is false. The day after is false a couple of hours after. So people listen, but don't ever try to tell people, go back to your activities because it's safe. It's absolutely not true. First, nobody knows. And, and so it's not a way to have people out of their rapid holes or out of confinement. So how do we fight fear? Uh, some things are very powerful, and you have wonderful mythology, but I don't have time to tell it about it. Humor works. So uh, humans like to play. They like to laugh. And if they see a group of people playing or laughing without them, they'll take the risk and go out. So humor and play, uh, we had this issue in the team. Uh, if you want somebody to join the team, it's not forcing, it's, but if you feel people are playing without you, they'll come in. So playing, laughing, modeling also. If you see that life is going on, again, there is a tendency to join in. And I think joining in helps to, to go beyond uh, the fear. So I, I do think that there is a way to mobilize things outside of the fear and also the fact of uh, in the joining in, I would say uh, to encourage very, very small, very, very small steps. So people who are terrified, we have a lot of people here in Parkex who don't even put a foot out. 
So can you first open the window? Can you get your hands out of the window? <laughs> can you get your, your door open? Maybe, you know, and you have some very nice community experiences of people talking from one step to the other or, and so the whole idea is, uh, I would say, play, humor, uh, and, and moving out of the, so we're not in the utopia. You've, a lot of you have talked how we're in a more dystopic vision of the world, but I think, so bringing a bit of movement, we're not going back to the utopia, but saying we can, we can move between, we can move moments of utopia and, and moments where we become more dystopic. So I think all of that is useful individually and collectively. Thank you. Um, there's uh, yeah, there's another there's another question uh, that basically you know is is related is related to this one, and it's about you know it's a it's a it's about the relationship between the state power and and people's and people's freedom and and, and fear. And so maybe th does anyone does anyone else uh, the, any other any other uh, speaker want to want to tackle that question? Uh, because the question here is very practical too. What can we do at mi micro level to resist? And thank you very much, Dr. Rousseau. That was really you know, a great kind of like first steps out of this kind of paralysis quarantine mind state, I guess. Um, and um, yeah, does does anyone does any other speaker wants to tackle the question? What what else we can do at micro level to 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 resist uh, fear, uh, maybe not state, maybe fear. Lisa, could you please paraphrase again the question about uh, state power and people's responsibility? Yeah, so, so the question exactly reads, uh, contrary to its promise, state exerts its power by taking people's freedom and expose them to fraud by injecting fear. What can we do at micro level to resist? That's the question from Shireen. I feel like a radio host. Oh, sorry. I, I'll just add, because I think that part of the overwhelming the fear is going back to agency and that means small scale defiance so so the whole idea is we do not want to push major transgression major transgression can mean death at some point but i think part of regaining power is is some forms of defiance and i i just Think in yourself, I'm sure you're all in a way or other defying the rules. <laughs> and that's important. It is key. Yes. Thank you. Sorry, Elisaveta. I think Robert yeah. would like to make a comment. Well, yes. Since, I've already had a turn, but since nobody else is volunteering, I mean, one of the curious things about the, the current strategy of the UK government is effectively to issue advice without enforcement and so that although in the early stages of the lockdown there was some quite energetic law enforcement uh, against people who were breaking the rules um, we now seem to be moving into a stage where the, the our government is is quite happy to see the rules decay through initiative and for state action to as it were follow civic action now that's being interrupted by various kinds of private ordering, uh, various institutions, transport net, transport operators, schools, trying to gold plate the regulations and to turn advice into rules. Um, the government's position is very much what well, we are giving you advice, but we are not going to use the power of the state to enforce it. So that if you stop observing a two meter distance, nobody's going to come up to you as a law enforcement officer um, if you choose not to wear a mask nobody will, will will tackle you in an official capacity about that um, and it, it, in a sense almost to see what ev what market forces evolutionary forces however you care to phrase it you know work out as as, as an accommodation between citizens um, no, I've no idea how that goes. It's a very Hayekian kind of vision, um, but there is a, at least some kind of coherence to it. I, I wouldn't as, ascribe the coherence to the ministers so much as to the maybe the civil servants who wrote it. Um, but but I, I I think it's it's a it's a plausible way forward, and I, I think consistent with some of the things that uh, Cecile was saying. Thank you. 
Does anyone else want to uh, want to tackle the big question of resistance before well, I, we I, move on to other I, questions? I would just add that uh, the other function it has, and you see this happening also in, in the US where they're trying to make policies that will indemnify the state or indemnify corporations, you know, to push through vaccines or drugs and indemnify corporations against future malpractice. It also has the function of removing any responsibility uh, from the state for things turning out poorly. So mm. the problem is, you know, it makes perfect sense if you have an irrational fear it makes perfect sense to gradually stick your hand out the window and do a little bit more and a little bit more and eventually you get over your fear. It's just not clear at all at what level is your fear irrational and at what fear is it prudent. Uh, and you will live longer and your relatives will live longer if you don't do uh, what you know, you're inclined to do for you know, just to be out there laughing with everybody else. So, I mean, for me, there's a dilemma there that we, we sorely need uh, guidance and, and information on which to, to um, uh, what can we say, calibrate our level of concern. Uh, and part of it is maybe the larger part of it, and I had moments of this myself that, that Robert was referring to sort of our you know, Ernest Becker kind of denial of death way our whole society is organized. That maybe if we just accept that, look, something's going to kill you, and at some point it may well be a virus, and that's what life is, and you should not live sort of, you know, panicked uh, behind closed doors trying to extend your life indefinitely. It's just not, that's not how this has been presented to us. It's been presented as this is a new uh, present danger way above and beyond the other ones that we, we face in everyday life. And I think we need help in recalibrating things uh, in some ways. And, and the fact that we're not getting it is probably because it doesn't actually exist, because nobody really knows the right you know, ratio to tell you and, and then becomes a more personal decision is this worth a risk? You know, one of the big differences culturally, it's apparent over the years, you come from North America, where in the last 10, 15, 20 years, there's very few people who smoke, uh, uh, you know, in, in public places, it's, it's uh, rarely seen and so on. And you go to Europe, and lots of people smoke, and they just consider it a part of their quality of life. And they think it's very childish that you know North Americans are so anxious about uh, I, you know Samuel understands what I'm talking about so concerned about longevity that they're just uh, diminishing their quality of life. It would be like not having wine because somebody told you wine was bad for your health or something. So there's that domain where we can just talk about cultural differences and how we weigh different things. And there's a current domain we're still in, which is where we were told this is a clear and present danger on a scale quite different than other things. And if it's not going to kill you, it could very well kill your grandfather or grandmother or something. So don't be selfish, don't be childish, you know, be patient and wait and so on. So now we're transitioning without necessarily, I mean, the arguments about economics are totally unsatisfying to me because it's exactly the typical calculation that industry in economics is more important than human life. I mean, who wants to hear that? So anyway, that's my <coughs> Sam? Uh, thank you, yeah. Um, I'd like to also suggest that uh, it seems that in democratic, in Western democratic countries, at least a lot of the really severe current lockdown measures are happening in response uh, to fear from the public and in response to a fear which may be uh, partly irrational. So along with Cecile, I would like to suggest that the way out of this problem is not through totalitarian measures, is not through forcing people to do anything, because it's interesting to note how people like to have at least the illusion that they have chosen their fear. But people don't really like to be frankly told completely what to do. So of course, one immediate pragmatic measure is say what we were interested in is, is reopening as soon as possible to prevent the excess death and all the collateral damage is to actually imp it would be to actually implement totalitarian measures, to have drones uh, that automatically find people, uh, take money out of their bank account, uh, to expel children from kissing in schools or from touching each other. I think if, if that happened, of course, the extremism of the measure would be matched by a hysterical backlash, which would also not be good. Um, so the, the middle ground nuance measure, as we know, in the age of uh, in the digital age will not work. Just giving people access to information uh, will not work because we keep talking about the overabundance of bad information, but there's also plenty of good information out there. It just so happens that mechanisms are in place, beginning with our own psychological mechanisms, such that we do not pay attention to that information. But I'd also like to also echo what Cecile said. So fear and panic are among the most contagious of all behaviors, 
but joy is also contagious. Effervescence uh, is also contagious. And, and even a sense of reassurance, a sense of comfort, a sense of pleasure um, is something that is contagious. So our human nature is, well, on the one hand, we're obsessed with dangers, but on the other hand, we're fundamentally social beings. We cannot function without social connection. So it's, so it's up to us to slowly reintroduce this sense of joy, this sense of togetherness, and it seems that's probably pragmatically the only way uh, to keep rebuilding a better world. How are we doing on time, Sam? Uh, we're just about running over schedule, so you may perhaps uh, take one other important question. On, I'll leave that up to okay, you. Okay, I'll, I'll I'll have to I'll have to choose one. Okay, all right, I chose I chose one. So okay, the the question here is is directed at uh, at Dr. Danny Frank, and I think this is a this is a fun kind of segue from fear to to guilt. <laughs> And the question here is, uh, just for clarification, could you go over the definition of guilt, confused as to why it relates to an external object or person that we depend on? So, so how does this, how does this work, uh, Danny? We, we can't hear you. Turn on your mic, please, Danny. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. So just as a segue from the last discussion, uh, I am interested in everything that's being said on a social level or a cultural level or an economic level. It all makes perfect sense. But don't forget the individual level. Like each one of us on this panel has our own individual take on this virus and how what we should do about it and how scared we are or not scared, how many times we should wash our hands, how many times we do. My next door neighbor washes his hands many more times than I do. There's a personal difference between us. So one of the things about the unconscious and the conscious mind and differentiating between internal and external reality is it's hard for us to be adaptive as human beings and accurately size up the external world and make adaptive uh, decisions. And if we understand our insides, that will help us. For example, if one person is uh, become clinically anxious and depressed, in the face of COVID, but their family members or their next door neighbors or friends are not, why is that? And it will help that one person to try to understand their, their life, their self, their insides, their history, their development, to maybe understand why they are different than their neighbor. So I'm drawing, I'm just bringing it down on a more microscopic level to the individual human being and their own personality over time. Guilt is really considered to be a, a a universal feature of human life. It is an anxiety that we have done something bad, that we deserve to be punished. We did something wrong. Now, of course, as I said before, we may have done something bad. If we abuse a child or mistreat an animal, that is, uh, I think, a God-given bad thing to do. It's, it's, by definition, existentially wrong. That's not the same as a kind of a neurotic guilt where you feel you've done something bad, but we wouldn't really agree with it if we looked at it into depth. Uh, for example, I'm gonna tell you, there's been a listing of different kinds of guilt. I, I've written them down here. Um, we, we have survivor guilt. We've heard of that. We have separation guilt. Some people feel guilty to stand up to our, uh, let's say I feel guilty to stand up to my mother and separate from her and leave home and go off to college because she'll fall apart because she needs me so badly. So I feel guilty toward her because I still need her, but I want to individuate. There is omnipotent responsibility guilt. If we are responsible, uh, so, you know, some of my colleagues are much more crushed by the uh, lack of uh, medical treatment resources for our patients under these conditions and others are more with a tougher mentality. I'm working in a mass unit and we have to do just deal with the most sick patients and most disastrous situations first and it's okay with me. I'm willing to function. Other people feel overly burdened by their sense of responsibility. Uh, there is self-hate, which speak to the uh, comments I made before about Sid Blatt and, and introspective self-criticism that people have. Let's say you... Uh, go after something you want and you get it, you may feel guilty that you have succeeded at something that you feel symbolically inside yourself is not allowed. 
uh, that's wrong, that's bad. So guilt is an anxiety that uh, is harbored there. I'll give you one more example because we don't want to go on forever. Uh, in my, pa I have a clinic like Vincent, patients with schizophrenia. And by the way, Vincent, we have a lot of it itinerants that we see in our building now. <laughs> Just so you could refer them. Uh, patients, uh, relatives often call me or come to see me and they complain about the lack of accessibility of the system, about the impersonality of the secretary or the nurse, not in my clinic, of course, but you know, I was thinking when I work in the emergency room, people are treated in a very uh, mechanical way. And the patients come in, the families attack the doctor right away and criticize how badly their relatives have been treated. Now, th th there's, that's the tricky thing. They're usually right. But they also are doing it because they feel irrationally and unconsciously guilty toward their sick relative, as if they are responsible for the sickness even if existentially they haven't done anything wrong and the sickness is completely out of their hands. Uh, I get phone calls uh, from certain relatives uh, telling me of the latest thing that they're worried about with their patient, but their patient has had uh, years of impairment where they're not functioning well, they're not at risk of hurting themselves or hurting anybody else, but they're not functioning adaptively. And they call me with endless uh, examples of that, which is not surprising. It's like if you have uh, coronary artery disease or uh, chronic obstructive lung disease, you're going to have symptoms. Nobody's surprised by that. So I'm not surprised when they call, but they're calling out of their guilt. I reassure them and they feel less guilty or they get it off their chest. But they have, they don't realize they're guilty. In their conscious mind, they have a real reason for complaining and worrying. Uh, it's just a human example that comes in my clinic all the time of, of where I see the phenomena of human guilt where the person's not aware of it. And so if we can complain about some atrocity out there in our society or our politics, we may be 100% right and maybe we should even be doing, doing more in a strenuous way to fight about it or change the world. Uh, our complaining is like virtue, virtue signaling that we feel less guilty once we've gotten it off our chest we've transferred the guilt oh i'm a i'm a wonderful person it's out there that's bad so again let me say i'm not by giving you the psychoanalytic perspective that i'm disavowing the real world i'm not i'm just saying the real world contains both the external reality and the internal reality thank you so so sam uh are we are we wrapping up or or what's? I think so. Yeah, I can share a few brief concluding thoughts, but uh, by all means, do share yours as well. Uh, now go 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 ahead. <laughs> okay, <laughs> okay. Well, I'm just overwhelmed with gratitude for a very very productive, very provocative, very very thought provoking conversation. I'm really thankful for all the panelists and and all the participants. I was just going to conclude by sharing my own two cents on guilt. From an evolutionary anthropology perspective, guilt is a complex pro-social emotion that is good to work with. It reminds us of our inextric inextricable links to other people. So I'm sure there's all kinds of productive ways in which we can use our guilt uh, to motivate subtle action. So that's what I really hope uh, that this seminar can leave us with, a, a sense of you know, refreshing new thoughts and perhaps prompting only subtle action, nothing, nothing radical, you know, nothing too much. So in this spirit, I'd like to close by uh, breaking from the recent cultural tradition of uh, wishing uh, safety and that people should stay safe. I'm not terribly interested in any of you or the world being safe, but I'm very interested in um, us being perhaps a little more joyful, a little bit ironic, not cynical, and just, yeah, using those very subtle powers uh, to bring about a little bit of change. So again, thank you very, very much, everyone. And we will make uh, the video uh, available on our channels very soon. Thank you again. Thank you. Silent clapping is a very interesting phenomenon. Indeed, indeed. <laughs> Never quite sure what the cultural protocol is for leaving. It always seems rude to just. Well, if you, yeah, leave you just quickly, <laughs> just become, at some point it becomes unclear who's leaving whom. So that's good. <laughs> <laughs>
Well, if you're if you're a host, you can just end meeting for all. That's yeah. probably uh, that would spare a lot of guilt it. on the part of some people who then worry, <laughs> oh, I left too early, and you know. I believe only Paula has these powers. I I was, I was not the host. <laughs> nice to see all of your faces. Nice to see your names and icons. Uh, and we hope we'll see you all in a few weeks for the next one of these. Okay. Bye. Thank you, Sam. Bye, thank you.